Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today. We hope you're all having a fantastic Friday. Of course, this is episode seven of Ham Radio Live. And as always, I'm joined by the icy one, Paul Lombardo. Icy? Yeah. No. Hell yeah. No, we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win today, Matt. We're settling the debate this week, finally. Ladies and gentlemen. In my refrigerator, we'll do this a little bit later in the show. In my refrigerator, sits no, we gotta do a, it. We should. We gotta do it earlier. You want to do it right away? Ask, not right away, but soon. Yeah, you know, we'll do it before we hit the news. That's what we'll do. Yeah. Uh, in my fridge is a is a cup of Mountain Dew, no ice. There's a cup of Mountain Dew with ice. They're clear, so the audience will see, so that they can they can look for themselves. And Paul, you also have a cup, correct? Yeah, I have two cups here. I have a just a normal glass. And a glass with ice. Okay. And then my drink is going to be Dr. Pepper, which has already been chilled in my fridge. So, but I haven't opened it yet. So the carbonation isn't going to get fucked like Matt's Mountain Dew. <laughs> so, so I'm going to win, but that's okay. We will find out shortly. Of course, after Drunk Volcano joined in our last call in at the end of episode six, we had to we had to go face to face here. We head to head. Sorry, not face to face. I don't want to make out with drunk volcano. Um, we had to go head to head here. <laughs> so um, that's what we're doing, and uh, we hope you all enjoy. And to everyone who's joining us live right now, thank you for those who are interested in joining us live. Uh, every week we're live on Fridays at six p.m. Eastern time on Mr. Maddie Plays on YouTube, so you can check us out. We'll schedule it. Tweets go live. It's a good time. We have a lot of fun here, so we appreciate those of you who join us live and improve the show. I don't really have any other housekeeping. We got our links in the description for mobile stuff. And I'm coming in feeling a little odd, you know, be because I realized something when I sat down before I joined call here. And I don't think anyone will ever guess it. So I had to walk my dog earlier today, right? And I was in pajama shorts. It's cold out. I threw on some sweats. I never changed out of my pajama shorts. So I'm wearing pajamas beneath my sweats right now. And it's it's not quite boxers. What? So it's it it feels it feels like I didn't get ready for the day properly. Wait, what by pajama shorts do you mean like like plaid shorts that would go down to my knees are beneath Weird. these sweatpants. Oh, yeah. And I I went to I, CBS I no in, in like this that. outfit. Yeah, I, I went to Why not just take those off and then put on your sweatpants? Well, I don't want to just free ball it. You know, I don't. Oh, you don't yeah. have underwear underneath. Yeah, dude. I'm just. Okay. So it's like a briefs almost. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Not as secure. So wait, so you free ball it in bed. Like you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Do you, do okay. you secure right. it in bed? I can't. I can't. It, it's too hot. If I'm either boxers or none, it's either or. But I, I have an I AC that. right next to my bed. So I don't ever have to worry about being too hot. Okay. I'm like constantly being blown with air. It's the best. Blown with air. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's a <laughs> Yeah. My my bed is always cool. Yes. So, I understand. So what yeah, you're it's not, it's nice. But I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm a little scared of free balling it because I sleep in like a little later than everybody else in my family. Mm. And then like occasionally some of my family members might need to come into my room. I don't know why. It doesn't happen too often, but like my mom's come in here before to ask me a question or, right. or say like something whatever's going on for the day, like, hey, I'm gonna be gone. And like, I don't want my blankets to just be like on the floor and I'm free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get, like that's definitely a play when you have your own house. You yeah. know what I mean? You don't, you don't do that. I don't, anymore. I don't risk the nude sleep. I don't, yeah. not yet at least. It's, it's, it's a comfy sleep, but yeah, definitely uh, not at your family house. I agree. Uh, we got a super chat real quick from Adam Thim. Hey there, ham fam. Just wanted to say, have a good weekend and give my mom some thoughts and prayers. She got diagnosed with bone marrow cancer. She's a fighter, but she could use a boost. Uh, you absolutely are our thoughts and prayers. And if there's anything we can do for you, Adam, let us know, but thank you so much for supporting us here and we will support you in turn. Uh, best wishes to your mother and to you as well, going through this fight with her. All right, let's get into what we're playing for starters. Uh, and let's keep this show nice and high energy for Adam here, Adam and his mother and, uh, give him something yeah, to distract him with, you know, that that's always important. So let's do our job here. And let's talk games or playing. Paul, I want to start with you because you've got the the trifecta of weebiness here. Yeah, this is something I, else, man. So, so I made it clear on the on the a few episodes ago on the podcast that I was going through like a JRPG drought, and I was like, I can't get into them right now. I need to play some more action games, some quicker like bite sized games. So I played Resident Evil Four. I played Bayonetta. Mm -hmm. um, I, I played Hades. I beat Hades or my first run anyway. I'm not done with the game. Um, 
what else? What else have we been playing? Like, a while ago, I was playing a bunch of games. Yeah. And then this week, suddenly, I just felt like an urge to get back into JRPGs. So, first thing I did was I beat Fire Emblem Three Houses because that was sitting on the on the back burner for a while. Mm-hmm. I got, I'd say, probably three fourths through the game, and then like the systems start getting really old, and I had to trudge through it a little bit. But sure. Um, but honestly, the thing that kept me going was just like building up my my classmates and stuff. Getting the class system is really cool in that game. If you haven't played it, I recommend it. But the story started getting like more and more boring. Yeah. And character, it was just getting drawn out long. I was doing the Golden Deer, um, okay. and, I, and I really like the Golden Deer because I like the characters. But I I ended up like. Um, you can uh, invite characters from other classes into your class. So I just got like all my favorite characters from all the others, and then I don't know. It's a really, um, it's a really tragic game in a, in, a, in a in an interesting way, and I think the story does its purpose. But I would have preferred like a a more linear, actually not linear. What's the word? I want. I would have preferred if all three stories just sort of like converged oh, right. and we had yeah. one single story. Even if you pick a separate house, but instead you have three different um, routes, which I haven't played the others, but I, I looked into them because I'm not going to play the game again. And um, I don't know. I just think the game could have been better if they picked just sort of like a single route. Although I don't really know Fire Emblem's history. Mm-hmm. You might know, like, in the past, do their games sort of They do or not. multiple versions. Like, there was Birthright and Conquest, and Conquest was considered, like, the very difficult version. Uh, and they would tell two sides of the same tale. But the difference mm-hmm. was that I don't think you get this with three houses where if I were to play Birthright, I got a part of the story and it was enough. It wasn't like I had to go out and do the other one. And then three houses turns into this like 200 hour game when it doesn't really I'm absolutely missing stuff. Like I don't know really anything besides what you've told me and a few others about Dimitri. Mm -hmm. Um, Edelgard, I know a little bit about, but not a lot. So if I really wanted to go get the whole picture, I'd have to play the game three times. And that game isn't worth playing three times. It's not like a Persona where it's just like every single time you're playing through it, it's enjoyable, enjoyable. Right. Um, so I finished that. Cool. And then I, and then I jumped into um, well before I get back in, into the other JRPGs. Uh, Matt, we both played Forza Horizon Five. Yes, let's did, discuss. This it. was uh, this was a big one. Yeah, it was a, a pretty big big review. Um, tons of fun. I was so surprised with mm-hmm. how much they innovated because I played every single Forza. Since uh, since the Horizon series started, I played Horizon 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I noticed with every new release that came out, I was playing the game less and less because they didn't really change too much. Um, and I was kind of getting worried for the Horizon series because it, it almost reminded me of like, even though they weren't releasing annually, it reminded me of like sports games or CODs where it's just like right. the same shit over and over and over. New world, same mechanics. Yeah. yeah. And then Horizon 4, I think, was that point where I'm like, okay, I really just don't want to play this because it just feels like more of the same. Sure. So I didn't play a lot of Horizon 4. I did play it probably like maybe 10-ish hours. Um, but Horizon 5, I definitely got to like around 15. And I finished like most of the story stuff for the review. And it it is, it is really good for a racing game. I, I don't even like to call it a racing game because I think it's more of like a driving experience. It's more an automobile experience. If you're like a, a gearhead or whatever, Horizon is absolutely for you. Yeah, I really liked it too. I was surprised pleasantly at it because I remember yeah, I was going back and forth with you. I was like, do I review this? I don't know if I'll have mm-hmm. more to say because after I did my preview, it's like I'm not, it's not like an RPG where once I take a deeper cut, I can I can get deeper on my thoughts. It's like, I'm very limited in this field is there's more I'll, I'll be able to say. And I was reminded of certain mechanics like event lab, like the gear tuning that you can do. That's always been there or has been there in recent en- entries, I should say. Uh, but also some of the new stuff, like you had messed around with the eliminator tournament. There was cool co-op racing. That I never really actually fun. played this game in co-op. So that was really new to me. There's a lot of you stuff that I, co-op? no, I always played it by myself. And uh, not that I didn't like it that way. Just, I, I typically did play by myself. That's what got me, like, when I played Horizon 1 and 2, um, a little less of 3, co-op was, like, the huge thing, because I had a group of buds that just loved Horizon, and I was telling you about this, but we made the game more difficult for ourselves to, like, challenge each other. Mm. It was fun. But, yeah, co-op is definitely something that makes that game a lot better. Yeah, it was a it was a blast when you and I were playing together. I mean, it, it, it was definitely the perfect chill game. I, I yeah. found it where we got into a pretty good groove where we were just kind of shooting the shit, but having a good time playing the game together. 
Um, the variety of races, especially, I, I liked, which, again, the series has been known for, where I'll be curious to know what longstanding fans think of this entry uh, beyond yourself who, who put hundreds of hours into these games because I wonder if is there enough new stuff for them. For me, it was more than enough, and especially as a Game Pass game, it's an easy recommendation. The quality is there. It's top-notch. Uh, I love the expedition missions. I thought those are great. Like those little self-contained uh, radius missions where it's like, go take a photo of this statue and then go to the top of this over here. And it, it kind of gave it this gameplay variety, even though you were limited to a car. So you had to think differently on how you were going to approach things. And I really like that. Uh, so I thought there was enough there, but I'm curious if the, the rest of the audience will think as much. Yeah, I found it to be very... Um very different from what I had played of Horizon 4 in terms of like I don't know it's hard to explain but it just has a very different feel and maybe it's because of the setting but they tried to do a story which was probably it's definitely the weakest point of the game mm. although I found the missions in the stories to be somewhat enjoyable but more so just the dialogue was really cringy like you, you and, and like the character yeah but, it, but that's not what the game's about I don't think that was really a massive selling point for it in the first place so I didn't really hold it against it in my review I was like yeah, there's a story here that probably doesn't need to exist, um, but it doesn't pull you out of the experience, and it's not horrendously bad. It's a game um, about, you know, things to do, right? And I guess the I view yeah. the story is an additive thing to do. It's another to me, thing you can do. What I did like about it was when I played Horizon 4, I felt, like, very lost in what I should do because there's so much things. There's all kinds of stuff to do in these games, and I felt that in Horizon 5 a little bit. But with the story and like these clear objectives, these clear missions that you had to do, I felt much more like, okay, I'm going to drive this way to um, whatever store missions across the map and anything along the way I'll do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it helped me feel much more. Um, I can't. I'm, I'm like losing the word Organized right now. probably. There, yeah. There you go. Organized or whatever, um, which was something I really liked about it. I think yeah. if you haven't played a Horizon game. Um, or if you haven't played one in a while, you should definitely pick five up because it's on Game Pass, like you said. I agree. And it's a great game. I agree, yeah. Great great pickup point for sure. There's no doubt about that. Uh, what else have you been playing? I see a couple more here. One especially I want to talk about, but one uh, <coughs> is a peculiar selection. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so yeah. Well, uh, the, the one of them, Atelier Rise of Two, mm -hmm. uh, Lost Legends and the Secret Fairy. This is the I peculiar one for those who don't know. <laughs> I have it right here. Uh, so this is a an interesting JRPG. It's a the Atelier series is a uh, <laughs> that's gonna cook me. It's up for interesting. This. I love those thick thighs. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's a long running um, anime series and JRPG series where it's all about crafting. And um, you basically, what I like about it the most is it's a very chill game. The story is very lighthearted, and that doesn't mean it's it's bad. It just means it's not thrown at your face. And you basically walk around like a map and you have different gathering tools and you just gather like materials and you throw them into a, your atelier, which is like your your crafting area and you make weapons, Oh, that's a armor. thing. Okay. I didn't know what atelier meant. Yeah. You throw it into a atelier. Okay. Interesting. Well, like, so your house is called Atelier Riza. Um, oh. Is yeah. it the main character's and, name, Riza? Yeah. Okay. Your, her name is Riza. That's that's a uh, Riza right there. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Got the thick thighs. Matt yep. hates that. <laughs> can't stand it <laughs> um and i don't know it's definitely so many jrpgs you have to like really hone in because the combat's insane mm. and the story's super heavy-handed and it's always super serious and it's like life or death consequences for these characters so it's really really um refreshing to play something where it's like yeah just put on some music or actually the game's soundtrack is pretty good so just listen to the music go collect high quality materials craft them and and build up your gear because um, it's all about just like getting better gear and um, unlocking like new skills through your character. So that's a two-way rise of two. I finished the first one and this one's a lot better. It has more quality of life changes. Um, and it just, it just feels much more like refined. Mm -hmm. But then we get into the last game. I don't have a, a box for it because I bought it digitally because holy fuck, it's hard to get a physical. For oh this game. yeah, it is. <laughs> Trails of Cold Steel. The Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel. And I was literally playing it like 10 minutes before the podcast. Let's and go. you know when you boot up a game? I had this with Hades, but you know when you boot up a game and you're like, yeah, this is going to be good. Like you don't even... Oh, like, really? Okay. You get yeah, this feel like, with the first one. That's impressive. Okay, good. Well, the intro, the intro sequence, um, 
you know what it is. I'm not going to say anything about it. Yeah. But just play, like the music and like I could tell there was a lot of um, hype going on. Like when I get to that moment in the game, I'm like, yeah, this is going to be it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and and the combat, um, it seems really in depth, but it was like simple enough to understand what was going on because they thrust you into it without explaining. And I was able to uh, you pick apart like what I'm supposed to do. Right. So I don't have much to say about it at all other than yeah, you're the music early. so far. The music so far. Yeah, I'm like probably like an hour and a half or two hours in. I love the music so far. Um, the art style is like, it's a PS Vita game, but I'm really liking the, like, the sprites. It reminds me of Persona 4. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's like, definitely Persona characters. inspired in, in its design yeah. in a couple ways. And that's like, let's go. I love that. So, we need to get yeah. Dustin back on this show because... Did he play it? He fucking hates Trails of Cold Steel. <laughs> Wait, which one did he play? He played the first one. He hated it. Like I, I remember crusading yeah. to him and Carrick. I was like, "You guys gotta try it. You guys gotta try it." Carrick, I knew like there's no shot he was gonna try it. Like Carrick's, Carrick was my pathway to Dustin. I was like, you know, I'll go through Carrick to Dustin. So I'm not just targeting one did of them. Did he beat it? No, Dustin didn't really get that far at all. But uh, yeah, he okay. he kept reporting it. It was funny because we had like writers who were dedicated ass Trails fans who were like sending Dustin like novels on what he had to do he's like yeah, look it's not that you just didn't like the game like dustin got why he's got to play trails in the sky first all this shit bro it's so funny uh so wow. it's you've saved yourself some time some exhaustion by liking it I'm gonna, off the I'm, bat i'm definitely gonna go on to one of dustin's live streams and just cook him up for that yeah <laughs> yeah he, he, he'll um, know he'll know <laughs> So, so that's what I've been playing, but we have some super chats, Matt. We didn't read these, so we should probably yeah, give let's, them a read. Let's fire them up real uh, quick. The guy, Jedi Dweller 123 says, Do you guys know if Skyrim Anniversary Edition allows your character to transfer to the new edition? And is the 20 upgrade the four free creation club or all the creations, Matt? Uh, this is on you. Yeah, so we'll be talking Skyrim Anniversary in a little bit. Uh, we're For those who are new here, because we do have a lot of listeners early on, uh, just know that what we do is we do our what games we're playing. We, we talk to the audience a little bit. We get into the news in uh, about 40 minutes or so. So just keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, to answer your question real quickly, uh, your character, as far as I know, should transfer because it's just a free upgrade uh, for the free four pieces of creation club content. $20 is for the rest of the creation club content on top of the new stuff we'll be talking about in our news section. So just keep that in mind. And then we got a second super chat from Michael S and uh, he's knocking on the door here. <laughs> Guys, you need to know this ice is worthless. Keep cans in the fridge and the cold metal keeps the drinks cool longer. Also, please talk about hog leg. I like this one saying hog leg. There we go. That's okay. a that's a dedicated listener. We 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 kickstarted the hog leg stuff, but uh, we'll definitely talk hog leg as we learn more. Uh, and we'll solve this this stupid metal can. That'll be the next step, right? It's gonna move to metal. It, it's not gonna wow. be about the cup and the ice. It's gonna be about the metal. But uh, no problem, Jedi. The, Happy to answer your that's question. That's the variable you have to consider, Matt, because you got metal cups, right? And it's, those are just it's fair. It's fair. But I threw ice in my metal cup after last week's show and then flaunted it on our Discord server. That's so, a maniac move. It is. Uh, just two things I want to talk about on what I'm playing. They're very brief. I wanted to let Paul do most of his because there's one thing I'm limited on and one thing I've talked about a lot. Uh, so I am playing Elden Ring right now. I have played Elden Ring. I can't. Say, I can't say. Yeah, I can't say any more than that. Uh, <laughs> keep an eye out. We'll, we'll talk a lot of Elden Ring in the coming week. And Halo Master Chief Collection. Uh, that is. Almost done. I am on uh, Halo 4 and Reach are what are left. Uh, we're going to play 5 as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm on Reach. We're going to start that probably tonight. Uh, finished Ooh. ODST. And that mission where you're on the rooftop at the police HQ in New Mombasa is is a masterful mission. Like Bungie at its best at one point, man. Like it is so good. Uh, it was like a new game to me. I had forgotten so much about it. Uh, so I've I'm been so playing curious. that. And, sorry, what? For you to, I'm so curious for you to play uh, Halo Reach because I think a, a lot of those missions are sort of like that, where it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, this this is it. Yeah. Now Reach, I I played launch month, and it's been since then. It's it's interesting. We were talking about wow. last night. I replayed the original trilogy a lot. I never really fell in love with ODST or Reach four, of course, or five. Um, it was just that trilogy by Bungie, and especially. Uh, combat evolved in two. I, I replayed a lot. Uh, those were much more stuck in my head. Uh, they they were the ones I loved the most. But yeah, now ODST, I think I can appreciate from another angle. It's it's not like to me the best story, but it's like this was something that needed to happen. Like a 
you're not chief. You're not this super soldier. You're just a, a normal person who's piecing together a mystery and trying to find their squad. And it's all about atmosphere and it's incredible. It's so, so good. So I have been enjoying that a lot. We're continuing to pump through them and probably within the next week or so, we'll be done with Master Chief Collection and everything it has to offer. And we'll be fully prepared for Halo Infinite. And for those who are interested, by the way, it's not too late. All, almost all of these games, except Halo 1, were uh, what I call one-tapped. Just done in one try. How long was Halo 1? Halo 1's about 8-ish, 9-ish hours. It's, it's definitely the longest because you have missions like the library, which you just cannot get through in a quick manner at all. Yeah. Even one of my my favorite mission in Halo, uh, Assault on the Control Room. Like, there's so many phases to it. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in it, but there's so many phases to it that those missions can run on pretty long. Uh, but the the rest of the game, you can kind of get through. Like, Silent Cartographer, you you like you got to drive around, get the, the the door open, and then drive back. So there's things that keep that game longer compared to others. Uh, where Halo Three, we beat in one night. I mean, that was like a four hour game. It was just like whoop, right through. So again, if anyone's interested, you can play all of these before launch, even if you're busy, because we, we haven't been starting playing until like 10, 11 at night, and we're still making really good progress. They're, they're perfect games for those who are busy. All right. It's time for tap-ins. Let's talk to the audience. We'll get into the news. We'll talk a little Skyrim. So Paul, whoever you want to pull in first, be my guest. Um, I'm going to bring in Sean Mason. All right, let's do it. Here we what's are, up, Sean. Sean again. Story time with Sean. Hey, what's up? Hey, what's going on, man? All right. Here so, we go. Hey. Here we go. Oh, I, th I thought I had this crazy story for you guys on Monday, but then something even bizarre. <laughs> ended up. I love right. these middle school stories. So, we're in second period. So, the second period just started. It's my prep period, so I don't have a class. So, I'm going towards the bathroom. I go into the bathroom, and all of a sudden, the lights go out, and I'm like, what the hell? Oh, no. Like, all right. So then I walk out. Everyone's free. Everyone's free. You hear it. kids from every class. I'm like screaming like, ah! Oh, no. <laughs> so, so the lights are out. So we're all we're all scrambling around. So we go. So I'm like, this is my prep. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll go help around. So I'm checking all the bathrooms, trying to find kids in there. <laughs> I don't really find anyone. So then I go down to the office. I'm like, hey, you know, is there any word on the power? They're like, oh, the janitor is going down. One of the custodians is going down right now. We're going to check the um, fuse box. He goes down to the fuse box and the door's locked. Oh, and he's like, wait. And he goes to find his key. He doesn't have his key for the fuse box door. And we're like, what the hell? So then this whole, for the next like 30, 40 minutes, we're like, I'm helping out. All the teachers on prep are helping out trying to find this fuse box key. And it's a huge mystery. And we're like, we don't know. So my principal's like, all right, well, I guess we're going to have to have no power until we find this key. So that they had a call central office. And um, was, it, was there like a consideration to send them home? Because I know like in my case, like they would send us home if the power was out for too long. Uh, there was, but because it was, there was no like power outage. Like it wasn't like a generator blue or something or oh, like okay. a transformer blue. We, we knew it was on our end. Gotcha. So we're like, so we're like scat gathering around, we're trying to find things. And then all of a sudden, our assistant principal goes, "Hang on, <laughs> let's get a list of all the kids who left the room right at the end of first period or during first period." So she has to send. So she sends an email out via like the phone, and she come and they send people around the room saying, "Hey, teachers, you got to check your phone, check your email." So we check our email. And we go, "Oh, we need a list of the kids who go to the bathroom." Turns out, remember the kid who, uh, you know, the mom, the pizza kid, the pizza oh, mom? no, it's a continuation. I was like, there's no wow. way this connects to last week's story. It does. Okay, so. It, 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 it kind of does and kind of doesn't. Okay. So the kid ended up, I guess he had a test second period in his STEM class. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to get out of it. So what he did was during first period, he went to the bathroom, found the janitor's keys they were sitting on like a table. The janitor was in the bathroom. He waited outside till the janitor went into the bathroom. Went and got the keys. My man's playing dishonored. Opened. Oh no. Opened the box. Opened like the door to the fuse box room. Shut all the lights off. Shut all the fuses off. Locked the door and then put the keys in his pocket and went back. Holy shit! How old is and this I'm kid? Like, how old is he? Thirteen. Wow. Wow. If he put and as much effort into sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but if he put as much effort into his grades as this. As he does with this, like, heist. <laughs> yeah. He'd be solid. This That's is insane. incredible. 
So what's so the turned, aftermath? Because you had to have discovered this at this point, right? So we didn't. So first we're calling, they're calling all the students in to figure out what happened. They finally get the kid in and immediately he's, I guess immediately he was like red in the face, sweating. Oh no. So finally <laughs> he goes, well, I did. He starts to blame someone else. He goes, I did see a kid walk over there and, you know, try to go into the, I saw him take keys and go into like the the room and, she, and for the we're all like what like what are you talking about no so then he's finally like yeah he goes I think I know who it is <laughs> and he points out to another kid he te- he tells them who this kid is so then they call that kid down and we're like they're all we're all reaming him we're all trying to get him and I I had a pretty good rapport with the other kid so the assistant principal's like hey Sean can you talk to him like maybe try to get him to see what's going on so I'm talking to him and I'm. Cause like yeah, I don't I don't really know what you're talking about, but I do know that the other kid, we'll call him Jack. His name's mm-hmm. not Jack. We'll call yeah. him Jack. Jack was bragging about doing something that's gonna send you know, be wild to the school. Wow. I'm like oh Jesus. No. So then they call Jack back down, and he finally admits it. He pulls the keys out, and he goes, "I'm sorry, I just didn't want to take my test." And he starts <laughs> bawling his eyes out. So then his mother comes in. Oh, this is where it kind of connects back. Oh, his yeah. mother has to come in. At the meeting. This is the mom's As plan. The mom. That's my prediction. Is the mom's plan. Shut off the power. Get me in those walls. I got to talk to Sean. As as she walks in, it's probably like, I, we're already on to like third and fourth period. The power's back on. But as she walks in, it's between third and fourth period. I happen to walk out of my room because I'm running to the restroom. Mm. I see her. And the second I walk in, she runs over to me. No. <laughs> she's like, hey, did you get my email? I'm like, Oh, I must have like I must have you know Spam. not seen. It. I get a lot of emails. Yeah. Like, all right, I'll send you another one. But I, I gotta go. I, I gotta deal with this. But I'm telling you, you gotta you gotta check your email. So I'm like, Fuck. Mm, like all right. She re-upped. So then later on in the day, I check my email. She sent me another. She sent me the same exact email again, saying, "Hey, I just want to make sure, let you know. Here's my PSN. Here's my number. Let's go out. Let's get some pizza." And come back and play games. I'm like, you've got to be kidding what, me. What you got to do is if you're not going to let her down lightly here, in my opinion, you've got to just strike up a talk with her and and bring up your, your fiance. You know what I'm saying? Like, just, just yeah, me and my fiance. Did she, I feel like actually, did you say that to her at one point? I didn't say that to her, but I'm pretty sure she knows because all the kids know I'm engaged because like on, so we had a back to school night and on the back to school night, like for the parents were there. Right. I, we do a PowerPoint about yourself, and I had a picture of me and her up there. I'm like, oh, this is my fiance, and gotcha. she was in the room. Okay. So, I don't know. I don't know. This is like bizarre. It's like very weird. Now, like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to ask you guys, what do you think I should do? Okay, that's the the question is. How, how can I let her down? How can I let her down? Yeah, the, I, I like this my because fiance thinks this is hilarious. By yeah, the way. I was gonna say. Normally, the question is like, what is this one wild thing that's <laughs> happened to you? But instead, it's just relationship advice with Sean. <laughs> I think you got to be careful with this woman because she definitely seems like a little, you know what I mean? Like she, she oh, yeah. probably she should she should know like this is inappropriate behavior. She's a, I imagine she knows or would remember that you mentioned your fiance. She maybe she wants like has this like home wrecker fantasy. I don't really know, but you got you got to be careful. Don't get yourself caught in the same room as her alone. That's absolutely something you don't <laughs> yeah. want to do. That's like, true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Not. I um I think my suggestion would be I've I've always been more of a direct straight shooter kind of guy. Um, you know, I, I, I would be of the mindset of you don't want to assume her interest, but if she's coming on pretty strong, then you can almost like lay it out to her in a way where for me, I don't like to 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 wonder about the, the emotional like aspect of it. Like, am I gonna hurt their feelings? It's like, look, you've made me feel uncomfortable at this point. Like, here's Here's how it is. Um, I just want to let you know, like I'm taken happily so, and this has to cease immediately. As Dustin would say, stand down, right? You got to let her know she's got to stand, <laughs> stand down, down, right? <laughs> Put the hand out and everything, stand down. Uh, yeah. You know, of course you appreciate it. You're flattered. It, it could develop from there. Just, I appreciate it. Thank you. But, you know, can't be doing this. I'm a professional. I'm trying to help your kid. That type of stuff, right? You, it, it's... um. Again, I think the straight shooting way is is probably the best way. Just lay it out for her. You got you got to remember that push. this this woman probably knows nothing about you personally. She's only met you like a, as a, like in a professional setting. Right. So like, if you do hurt her feelings, it would probably be for like a week. You know, maybe. Oh, I'm not worried. I'm just like, 
I don't want it to be weird with her kid. Yeah. Kids <laughs> no. I wouldn't worry about that, right? <laughs> I, I, I look hey, at Mom. it like uh, my friend Tyler has this rule, this life rule. He says, when I make a decision, will it matter in a week? And, and Paul saying that thing uh, sparked it. So that's how I look at it. Like, would this be a big problem for you in a week? Probably not. So it's like, just you know, pull the Band-Aid off. I just, I, what I worry about is like, what if she starts going after you and she's like, you're a bad teacher and she starts complaining <laughs> nah. to the school and stuff like. Oh, I don't think she will. Mom, I have a, like, I'm not trying to like brag. I have a pretty good, like a uh, reputation okay. school of being like a really good teacher. Uh, a lot of the kids tell the guidance counselors all the time. Like, oh my God, Mr. Mason's awesome. Yeah. Like, I had so no like, doubt. I wouldn't worry about that. And I'm pretty sure they have an inkle. Um, they they kind of have, they kind of know this woman's like, no, yeah. 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 I'm not like, you know, okay in the head. I guess she had, Supposedly she had a problem last year right. with a teacher and in elementary school she had problems with other teachers. Right. So Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would say just uh, lightly let it down, you know. Lightly place her right. down. Let her flow. Well next time if next time I come back, whenever that is, whenever you guys feel like having me, I will have another story. I'll have a story, but I will ask you guys something. Not not for advice. I'll ask you guys. Oh, a- we we love to help the audience too. Don't worry. <laughs> Oh, well, I appreciate it. Of course, Sean. Best of luck. It'll be okay. Don't overthink (laughs) it. And uh, you got this, man. Yeah, I'll keep you guys updated in the chat. All right. Yeah. (laughs) Let us know on the Discord. Take it easy, Sean. Looking forward forward to the rest of the episode. Bye, guys. Later. All right. Best of luck to Sean, uh, whose escapades have ascended now. And um, he's battling up the pizza lady. This is Sean Mason radio because I'm more interested in knowing what happens with pizza lady than I am in some of the news today. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is, is drunk volcano in the, uh, in the yeah, show? he's waiting. Why you don't want to bring, bring him in. in. That, that'll be a good transition. Yeah. yeah we'll, we'll, okay. We got to talk Mountain Dew here. Hello, drunk volcano. All Welcome. right, here we go. All right. All right. All hey, right. what's up? Paul, what's you on? get him started. I'm going to get the drinks. Okay. Right, so, go. Uh, well, I guess. Do you have any questions for us now that we we brought you in here? Are you just are you just here for the show? Are you here to see us? I'm, I'm here things? for the show, but I'm also here to talk about the new Call of Duty. Oh, have you been I, playing it? Yeah, let's just say I put an unreasonably amount of time in the first day it came out, which is wow. one p one a.m. today, and I put eight hours into it already. Wow. So is this is this a good eight hours or is this a bad eight hours? So this is a good eight hours, but it depends on what game mode you're playing. Okay. So well, I'm talk. waiting for Maddie to put on the headset so I can yeah. give him another one. <laughs> let's do this. Because Matt, Maddie plays COD in like the worst play, way possible, and that's competitive. Yeah. Which is <laughs> so Volcano said he's been playing eight hours. He's played eight hours of Vanguard. Vanguard. Okay. Yeah, okay. Are you enjoying? I, it? I'm. I have been enjoying my experience as long as I'm not playing Domination. I've only been playing Patrol, oh, no. which is if you guys played the beta. Have you? No, no, mm-hmm. not much. The patrol is this game mode where there's a circle, like a kind of like a hard point circle, except it travels around the map. Mm. So it constantly keeps the combat fresh because the people are moving. And for some reason, dude, the spawns in domination, it ain't it. Yeah, yeah. spawns have gotten worse over the years. Worked. They, used, yeah. they used to be my favorite mode, but I don't play it anymore because it just it's so it's it used to be controlled and now it's not. Yeah, I've it's also really um, so I don't know if you know about the well you probably don't. So there's three different type of modes, like a uh like player count. So you could have like a six v six, a seven v seven, or or greater. And then there's this one called Blitz, which is the most amount of players in one map. How much? That's the only mode I've been playing because I feel like chaotic cons the best. Right. One. So I've been grinding that out. Uh, the maps because obviously maps. I've only played multiplayer. But the maps, uh, eh. there's mm-hmm. some uh, good ones. Uh, there's some bad ones, <laughs> some really bad ones. It just depends on your play style. So there's like a couple long range maps where they're really open, and then there's a uh, there's some world. There's two world at war maps. Uh, I don't know if you guys played that game. World at war? Oh yeah. my god, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, that's what I thought. But yeah. just what maps are my favorite? Uh, but uh, they had dome. Okay. Okay. And that's a that's castle. a oh, dome. Thing. Dome castle, is castle's fu- one of my favorites, but dome, man, that was Cas- castle's your favorite. I fucking hate castle. Yeah, the wait, castle wait, is just the from... layout's so fun to me. It's it's dome like a bunch of Wichita? weird random perches that you could just get up and do. <laughs> I think wait, castle but... looks pretty. Yes, definitely. Which game is dome from? 
A World at War. They're both from World at War. I thought it's, Dome was MW3. No, Dome, Dome was World at War. It was like no, a he, he is right. Map. Was it he is right MW3 also. MW3? There is two Dome maps. There's the MW3 map. Oh, and then there's the World at War. war uh, if you played the campaign, it takes the map setting takes place in the final. Mm, okay. I don't know if you guys remember that. At I all. don't like MW3 at all. So to tell you the truth, <laughs> no, I, I was talking about World at War. Oh, World them. at War. Yes. It, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Then you're climbing up the steps and all that. Yep. So yeah. Oh, of course. Classic. Classic moment. But yeah, so I've been enjoying it and uh, been pretty good. You guys gonna check it out? Uh. Or... No, I uh, yeah, I uh, I'm kind of like anti COD after just years and years of the multiplayer kind of being. Meh. But you mm -hmm. you're saying you like it. Have you been playing COD every year like recently? I've been playing COD every year since World at War. Wow. Oh, wow. okay. So yeah. you seem to enjoy but, it more than I. What, that's what, what my national pass. Because I I really good... enjoy Modern Warfare. So if oh, then you're gonna MW 2019. Yeah. That Modern Warfare. Okay, then you'll like this one. Okay. Because, uh, like, uh, it's the same engine as Modern Warfare. Right. So it's the same movement, the same feel. It's a little quicker than Modern Warfare, which okay. I think is a plus because Modern Warfare could sometimes be slow. Yeah. I and then, so, see, that was one of my main complaints with Cold War is it felt old, dated, clunky. It but yeah. I did put eight days and two hours in Cold War. Ooh. So hey, still dude, put a bunch can, of campaign could justify it on its own. Oh, you haven't played it yet in Vanguard. The zombies in Vanguard, right? No, nah, no. Nah. So I do know. I looked at the. I just checked out to see if they brought back the loadout system from Cold War, which they mm -hmm. did. So you can have the field upgrade ability in the starting gun class. Right. So I feel like zombies. I haven't played the map yet, but I feel like it'll be good. Okay. But right. I think it's time to get into the meat of potatoes of this Colin, and that's the oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. So clearly labeled. We've got, it says none on this. I don't know if it kind of is showing up. None. This means no ice. This was poured into a clear plastic cup and it is no ice. Then we have ice labeled in red. It's got ice in here. I'm going to try to tilt it a Barely little even bit. See yeah, it. You can kind of <laughs> see the ice a little bit. I'm sorry that it's not fully clear. These are the most clear cups that CBS had. Mind you. I got stuck in traffic for all of this. So if anyone's about to complain, I'm going to ask you to start to zeet because I went to extreme lengths to get this done. Now, to verify, and it's great that Drunk Volcano is here, we're going to test to make sure that my theory is true, which is that the iced Mountain Dew is going to taste better than the not iced Mountain Dew. It's going to stay colder. It's going to be more refreshing. It's at a perfect time. I have no food in my system. I, you know, I'm getting a little bit of, uh, I'm like, I'm salivating a little bit more. So I'm in a good position to drink some soda, I think. And I haven't drank so, soda in years, mind you. And my theory, or at least what I know, this isn't a theory. This is a scientific law. Okay. This has been demonstrated time and time again, <laughs> but, uh, iceless, whatever soda we're drinking. I have Dr. Pepper. I'm a big Dr. Pepper fan. Definitely one of the best sodas out there. Um, without ice. It says a lot about cold. you. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how to respond to that, Matt. But um, <laughs> Mountain Dew is definitely one of the worst ones in my opinion. So you know, uh, come on, we can't be taking <laughs> shots at Mountain Dew. Here. Mountain Dew is great. I don't know, man. I think it's overrated. But but besides the point, uh, yeah, I think the ice list is going to be way better, and I'm ready to demonstrate that. Okay. Well, please, if you'd like to start, science fan, then um, so, by all means. Our, right off the bat, here, I'm just going to show you guys. We have my ice and uh non-ice and as you can see the color is already getting diluted at the top you can oh, very stop. clearly see the ice look through. at the volume level too yeah it, hold up both glasses right next to each other again and like right next to each other no that's ridiculous that's just an uneven can, pour oh it is uneven so but that's not what i'm talking about here i could fix it if you want but that's not the point that's of the discussion. no need to fix just drink what i'm trying to demonstrate is you can tell that the water has already diluted the top it's already being watered down so i'm going to take a sip okay you love immediately. that you love that right? immediately i i still taste a little bit of the sugar because i just poured it but immediately the carbonation it's already getting flat and i just cracked this open so it shouldn't be it's already getting a little flatter 
Um, I'm tasting less of that sugary syrup that I'm, I, I want when I'm drinking a soda. Because if you're drinking a soda, you want to go all the way. You're tasting the water back, right now is what you're saying? Like that's. No, I'm tasting uh, like 75% Dr. Pepper. Let's take another sip. 25% water for sure. I can definitely taste A quarter taste of your sip was water. Okay. I'm yeah, you, can, you can feel it on your lips, the, yeah, the okay. ice. You can tell that the, the carbonation has been diluted a little bit. And here we have a nice cold... Iceless Dr. Pepper. Okay. He's taking a sip right now. Mm -hmm. I think Drunken Volcano definitely brought up a point that I wasn't going to bring up, but you can feel it on your lips. You can feel the carbonated <laughs> soda hit your lips. It starts to sparkle a little bit. You know that feeling. And I, I bring it in my mouth and the flavor just explodes. I'm, I'm tasting it on all sides of my, on my tongue or on my face. And then... Around your face? What the fuck are you drinking? It's Dr. I mean, Pepper. Oh, stop. <laughs> that Dr. Pepper is delicious. And once again, this just tastes, it tastes even more like water now. My man said he's feeling it around his face. <laughs> it, this, this definitely is, <laughs> I, I already am not interested in, in fact, I won't be drinking that. I will be drinking this, but. No, okay. we have to, we have to continue this right. 10 minutes <laughs> yep. later. You, you have to save oh, some right. for 10 right. minutes later. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and set a timer now. So whenever we're in the middle of the discussion of news, yeah, we'll, stop. <laughs> we'll likely be mid-Skyrim discussion, much to the yeah. uh, chagrin of many. Okay, so. Already, already it's tasting bad. We are going to, we're going to get to the ice because the ice is definitely melting a little bit. I think that's good. That's in my favor because honestly, I'm trying to prove <laughs> a point here on the ice front. Uh, I want to prove the point here that, that these are going to taste the exact fucking same. Uh, the only difference here is this is going to be a lot colder, the one with the ice. So let's get that one started here. Okay. No comment yet. Yeah, get both in. Yeah, get, both palettes. Get both in. This is important. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I concede. I was wrong. I was wrong. Wow. That was way more carbonated. That was way more carbonated. That 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 drink without the uh the ice. That was different. That hit different. But is carbonation better for you like are, are you preferring i like bubbles ice? yeah i don't want to drink flat soda that's not how i roll yeah. i can see wow. i was incorrect paul wins you know drunk volcano wins I, yeah, I yeah. I feel <laughs> i definitely feel like an urge to, to say i told you so but it's been what years since you've had soda so oh you know, i'll do it i told you so <laughs> i was right you were wrong the only thing that, that i will liberty. hold on here is these will not be drinking for the rest of the show that's the one thing I'm going to hold over Paul. I said, no more. No more. That's okay. I'm going to enjoy my soda because I'm not a maniac. Okay. That, that's fine. Now now that you can enjoy, now that you realize, come to your senses. But you know, enjoy gonna, your soda. I wanna, I, that might be just soda, though. I want to, again, defend water. For example, water with ice. No that's one ever. A no-brainer. No, yeah, no, no one's one arguing ever. that point. No, no one's arguing that <laughs> that's point. That's trying to find... Man, you don't need to find footing. You can just admit you're wrong. You don't need to be like half Dude, wrong. the first thing that came out of my mouth. Name, I can see name one person who's ever said water with ice is bad. Dustin. I mean, Dustin said that? No, but I'm, really? I think he did. <laughs> you're going to throw Dustin over the fire. <laughs> Carrick did. Okay. We're, yeah. we're going to need like, Dustin to come on and defend himself. So right, right now, we're just like throwing <laughs> yeah. all the shade at him behind <laughs> his back. <laughs> Right, doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> I, I know Dustin did not say something so heinous. Uh, Matt, you were wrong. That's okay. Um, other drinks with ice, we can just talk about them. I don't know. Orange juice. Oh, are, you an, are you an orange juice? Let's with ice just guy? not. I'll do it for the no. audience. Let's yeah. just let's just yeah. not. I conceded. Let's just not drag on my defeat any longer. <laughs> Okay. okay. I don't know. I just I would love to see Matt just admit he's wrong again. This is very <laughs> rare, by the way. This is very rare. Yeah, it's rare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had to come up with a whole discussion. <laughs> I wanted to make sure we were the best defense. Well, we had Mediator Volcano awesome. here and he helped us a ton. This has been what, a three episode discussion hour yeah. two. I can't remember. Yeah. Well certainly it's been a lot longer. Oh okay. The, for the whole ice debate. Oh yeah. It carried into the end of Ham Radio a lot or Ham Radio yeah. podcast. And oh okay. Yeah. Right. So this right. yeah, you were picking up where, where we had left off, but we've actually found a conclusion to that arc and I'm looking forward to our next battle. I'm sure it'll be just as stubborn. Um Yeah. I'm very excited. But let's let's get into the news, all right. Uh 
we got a lot of people waiting for us to talk about Skyrim. Yeah. So <laughs> very excited to dive into it. Certainly not just ushering us along here because I've lost. Set me off. Yeah. Let's see how this. Get out, Volcano. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, I didn't think right. he'd leave. I was going to actually say goodbye, but thank you, Volcano, yeah. for calling in. We he... appreciate you. That was a good time. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Volcano. And it's time to talk about Skyrim, Matt. It is time to talk about Skyrim, and we'll revisit the soda in like seven minutes. So I'm revisiting now. Let's uh, let's talk about this. So a lot of people have been enjoying going, what's the price? We're going to talk about that now. For starters, Skyrim Anniversary Edition is $50 on its own. It will have its own separate physical release, but right now... $50 on its own. Let's say you're a special edition owner. $20 upgrade. Not too bad. This is not including, by the way, Game Pass. Currently on the Bethesda Net Post, there is no mention of a special Game Pass upgrade price, which Pete Hines has already stated will happen. So there's a good chance that if you're a Game Pass sub, maybe 10, 15 bucks, uh, he called it a special discounted price. So just know that if you have Skyrim Special Edition and you have Game Pass, you're going to save a lot of money on this. Again, physical version will be brand new. Uh, they said, yes, there will be physical copies of Skyrim Anniversary Edition for PS4 and Xbox One systems. Please note that while the physical edition contains a game disc, internet content, internet access is required to de redeem and download the Creation Club content included in Anniversary Edition. So what they're doing here is, uh, I think, a little slimy. They're repackaging special edition and then forcing you to download the new content. It is not on disc. Uh, is Skyrim getting wow. a next-gen upgrade? Yes, owners of Skyrim special edition or the anniversary edition on PS5 and Series X slash S will receive a next-generation upgrade for the game. The upgrade will be free and optimize the game with enhanced graphics, faster load times, and more, which we have yet to see and we don't have many details on. Also, will achievements and trophies carry over or will they be brand new? It's really important for a lot of people. Any achievement slash trophy progress earned while playing Special Edition will carry over to Anniversary Edition, except when upgrading the PS4 version of the game to the PS5 version, which I found to be very interesting again. So if you're looking for a reason to get the entire trophy list for Skyrim again, get it on PlayStation because you will, you will be compelled once oh. more to dive in. And I think that's actually a pretty significant selling point. Like, I was going to get it on Xbox, but seeing that, I kind of want to go with PlayStation now to know that it's a fresh trophy list compared to the uh, the PS4 yeah, version. Yeah, I would. That, so, for the first thing I'm going to mention, does that mean if you have the PlayStation 4 version and you transfer over to the PS5, does, is it going to pop your trophies like it does with Spider-Man? Because remember Spider-Man, you upgraded. Yeah, I do remember uh, that. And you just immediately on the main menu, it popped all your trophies. I, I wonder if it's going to be like that. Um, yeah, it says it will carry over. So I, that doesn't really specify. Now that I read it again, it says any achievement slash trophy progress earned playing special edition will carry over to the anniversary edition. So I don't know if that means there's a separate list. And like you said, they all pop. This is very confusing. What does it mean? Upgrading the PlayStation 4 version of Skyrim Special Edition to the PlayStation 5 version of Anniversary Edition. Is that what it's saying? I didn't explain yeah, this very well. It's yeah. very poorly worded. Yeah. Post. I don't want to nitpick them too hard, but you're totally right. And we'll find out shortly. We'll have these answered soon. But I, I do find that peculiar because it could go either way, like the way you had understood it and the way I had understood it initially yeah. before rereading it. We'll find out. So we will find out on that. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit more about the content too that's there, and then we'll have an overall Skyrim discussion. Um, so there's a number of new pieces of content coming through Creation Club that'll be available for those who upgrade, whether you're uh, paid or there's the four free pieces, which is like fishing and survival mode, that type of stuff. But this is this this is the content, a sneak peek at the content that is going to be arriving to Skyrim Special or I'm sorry, Anniversary Edition if you pay for the upgrade. Again, for those who are listening live, if you pay for the upgrade, there's Red Guard Elite Armaments, Stabs, there's a Dwarven Home. Uh, gold brand which is a brand new sword you can do farming in this game which i thought was really cool uh so you can purchase and upgrade animal pens windmills apiaries and stables uh, and build your own commercial empire growing crops with animals there Stardew valley skyrim yeah really it is uh bitter cup which is a brand new quest with uh choices in it they mentioned that there's a number of ways you can approach that quest uh they also introduce let's see here uh, necromantic grimoire uh, this is a 13 plus 
necromancy themed spell pack which allows for the conjuring of skeletons apparitions other powerful creatures like the mighty bone colossus uh, there's the contest where uh, this is a brand new quest where you're settling an argument between two warriors there's the bow of shadows uh, another player home called blood chill manor uh, headsman cleaver fearsome fists gallows hall which i believe is another dungeon the way it's described and that's not even getting into ghosts of tribunal and the cause which are these more significant expansion level quest lines where one has to do with uh, morrowind and one has to do with oblivion kind of like a nostalgia throwback so they're adding a lot of content and i gotta say i'm a little surprised that they're only charging 20 not that it should be more but i'm just surprised it's 20 bucks i was actually kind of thinking it was going to be 30 and they were really going to push the limits on this one but 50 dollars launch tag i think that could have been 40 uh but at the end of the day it's way less egregious than I expected. What are your thoughts on what they are charging us for Skyrim Anniversary Edition and some of the content coming to it? So immediately before we even started discussing this, I was going to be very adamant on how $50 is insane for Skyrim. But I didn't even... I didn't even... I, I read up on the content that was coming. I didn't remember reading anything about farming and like these Oblivion Morrowind quests. So I'm actually going to shift my stance there a little bit. And I have to agree. I think... Twenty dollars for an upgrade is is perfect, um, but but fifty dollars for the base game, I yeah, it probably could be forty. You know, a lot of this content is stuff that already technically existed, and they're reselling it. Mm -hmm. um, it was Creation Club stuff, so that is, I think it's acceptable. I th I yeah, I agree. I, you know, you know what's funny? I don't actually know if I own Special Edition. <laughs> oh really? Like I yeah, I don't. I have to check. But if I do, it's for Xbox. So I'll probably end up buying the $50 version on PS5 anyway. Mm -hmm. um, also because I have never played Skyrim on PlayStation because I remember PS3 Skyrim was horrendous. Right. Very buggy and just didn't work. So it'll be interesting playing Skyrim on a, a PlayStation console and getting all those trophies. I feel like a platinum trophy hunt for Skyrim would be so fun. It's it's a good time. Yeah, I, I got all the have achievements you on 360 for Skyrim. And yeah, it was it's a good time. Uh, actually, okay. I shouldn't say that. One of them bugged and didn't pop. It was the level 50 achievement that you had to hit. It didn't, oh, that's it, easy to get. You can just... Yeah. You can do that again. I could do that again. Yeah, so... Uh, that remember that, that one bug pop. where you could put the book in your house? You put like... It was like an XP book. You could put it on the, oh, on the, the shelf and oh, just yes. pick it back up. Yes, it that was a up. huge glitch yeah. for that game, right? It was one of the main quest line books that you'd get. I forgot mm. what it was called, but uh, I know which one you're talking it about. Leveled you. It scaled you everything. It scaled everything. Yeah, it was nuts. <laughs> I forgot about <laughs> so you that. You get that trophy for free. I forgot about that. What if they that. fixed that? Oh yeah, they definitely did. Yeah. Um yeah, I'm I'm really excited to dive back into this though, especially now seeing that they didn't just completely destroy people's wallets over it. Uh, again, I I thought with the way GTA 5 was going, they were going to charge us 60 with a $30, $40 upgrade uh, because one thing that's easy to forget now that we finally got our answer is Bethesda was very quiet on this. Like they were not giving us any details on the price they were telling us content like oh there's an aquarium you could fish now survival mode todd howard's doing an ama on reddit like we're doing all these cool things and then they finally finally gave us the news that we were looking for and it wasn't even that bad where i'm wondering what they were figuring out there uh but i'm glad it's not bad news i'm glad we have nothing to bitch about here um to me that's totally fine and uh, by the way it was called the ogma infinium that was the book that you would glitch that would allow you to level up a ton. Uh, but I'm, I'm really excited to dive back into this one. And I'm, I'm happy that it's priced at a fair point. Because look at Skyrim Special Edition. You remember when that came out? That was kind of underwhelming, right? Very. There wasn't really much content at all, right? No, there was nothing new added outside of visuals. Upgraded graphics. Yeah. I don't even think it ran in 60 frames. I'm pretty sure it was still stuck in 30 on the Xbox One and the PS4. Yeah, it was. It, yeah, it was actually. Now you mentioned that. Wow. And then there was the Switch version, which came out. And that, that had a had, new look and feel, but it was like the, the, the Zelda Amiibos. And they were like, yeah, you could yeah. interact using Amiibos. So I borrowed Brian's. Uh, he has a whole Amiibo collection. I was like, do you mind if I just use all these just to see what happens? And they just spawned chess. Like it was really, yeah, but you really can get underwhelming. The master sword, can't you? Yeah, yeah, only with the uh, Breath of the Wild Zelda one. But once you get uh, that, like that was the only new content. So for me, I'm yeah. actually excited because it's like now we're getting a lot of new content for Skyrim, and it feels very long overdue, especially with what we've paid for in the past. It, it 2020 hindsight, right? Like Skyrim was much more recent at the time it released, where there was, I think, an anticipation for more of that. Uh, but now they're finally giving us more uh, after. Um, 
so long and I'm, I'm just happy it's actual content and stuff that looks playable and looks fun to go out and get and you can just farm it down uh, farming alone is super cool because like you can build your house i don't know if the farms will be near like the houses you know and like falk Reef. yeah i think it was the hearth fire dlc where you could like hearth really fire build up <sighs> yeah it's such a good uh dlc it was it was a lot smaller but like in a good way i think yeah. it was like cheap too yeah um, it was like 10 bucks i want to say that like i'm assuming that sort of ties into this farming DLC, which I hope it does, because imagine like you can raise your family, mm -hmm. but then you bring them to like the farm. Yeah, it's literally so Stardew, Stardew Valley Skyrim. <laughs> I, I love that idea. I dig that. Yeah, yeah. I, I and then too. you get the fish tanks. Because well, the thing that the thing that sucked about Fallout Four was it literally took Hearthfire and made a whole game around it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and that wasn't the play for a Fallout game. Like I could see a, a side thing; it'd be very cool, but fully expanded upon i don't think it worked out all that well for them uh, but now that we have skyrim which clearly has its focus on exploration questing factions and this fit this fishing and farming and home life slice of life stuff is added afterwards it's like okay i'm more, i'm way more about this now because it's additive it's not a core component right yeah i think it's 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 just adding more and more to a game that's already great and I think it's what they need to be doing, right? Because you, you, they could re-release Skyrim over and over and over, but eventually people are going to just be like, yeah, I've played this game enough. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel as if they, they're they like, okay, 4K, 60 frames, Skyrim, here you go. It, it wouldn't have yeah. sold as much. I really believe that. No, you're, um, you're right. People were probably tired of it. I do find it disappointing, and some of the people in the chat do, is I would have liked new achievements and trophies added into I was the thinking the same thing. When we were talking, like all this new content, I was like, they could probably put tie trophies into some of them, but you know, they didn't mention that it's not going to happen. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a little thing, but maybe it's because like it's technically creation club content and they're like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. It, it probably so, has something to do with that though. Just the way it's structured in general. Yeah. But it's all canon stuff technically. Right. Cause creation club is canonical. As far as I'm concerned, I mean they're doing. Know, as as far as I know, I am not an Elder Scrolls I know lore when, geek, but it doesn't I know look like Fallout it was. Yes, yeah, it, it was right. Yeah, they, they yeah didn't because do you could that broke it. It seems in Skyrim though. Yeah, in Fallout they had like there was a <laughs> one of the coolest ones was you could find. Remember Wally Mack? He's a Fallout Three NPC inside of yeah. Vault One Hundred and One. Yeah, you could find him in Fallout Four Creation Club. Really? He, he had he was he turned into a ghoul, and there's a whole really it, yeah. It was pretty nuts, but I was just like, so disappointed I didn't know that, that was locked behind. Yeah, so there was there's some uh some like cool little quests that Creation Club has. So that's why I was wondering if this is technically canon. Yeah, I imagine so because the way I looked at it was none of this looked to break anything in the terms of the yeah. lore. Like it didn't it didn't really look like it was stretching anything out. So I think it's totally gonna be fine with that. Do you think they're gonna do Fallout Four? anniversary edition if you will like a next gen update with uh with of course new content from creation club because i feel like Please. if they see this does really well yeah i'm hoping so i don't want us to get into the whole spiel like we have for the last couple of weeks of like oh dude fallout 3 do new vegas but do you think we're going to see that with fallout 4 um because now we're getting closer and we're seeing the price that they're charging for it and i'm like this probably isn't a mega for profit play but they're probably making good money off of skyrim again and i'm sure they got to look at other entries that they can you know, touch up a little bit, minimal effort, and say, like, okay, let's repackage this. I don't know, because Skyrim is such a special game, like a special case, that I feel like all the stuff they've, like, resold the game, what, this is, like, the fourth time now? Mm, I feel yeah, as if... Or is it that. fifth? <laughs> okay. Well, they've yeah. sold... It, it depends like, what you want to count. Like, this is the third... This is, like, the third... Or, sorry, fourth generation. iteration. Uh, third yeah. generation. Yeah, there's a lot of ways you could spin it out, but go on. But basically... They were able to do that because Skyrim is so critically acclaimed, and it's almost like a huge meme of like, <laughs> like they even memed it. Remember with the Alexa ad oh, or whatever? Yeah. Skyrim. So they know, right? But Fallout doesn't have that status, especially not Fallout Four. I think like Fallout Four is, while it was a good game, but like they sort of understand that there was a lot wrong with it that mm -hmm. made it sort of like underwhelming. So I don't know if we'll end up getting that Creation Club treatment. However, I think if they did, it would be smart because it would get people back into it. People would appreciate it a lot after coming off of seventy six. Right? Yeah, people would probably return to it and sort of see it in a better light. I I think that would be true. Um, I agree. I agree, and, and, and that's probably why they're avoiding it. Now you mentioned that. <laughs> what makes it? Why would they avoid that though? If it's uh, if it's gonna 
if you think it's going to make 76 look unfavorable and that's already kind of a weak. I think product. 76 already looks unfavorable. I think that. Yeah, you think they just accept it? They're like, fuck it. Yeah, fuck 76. Yeah. I'm done with that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the project lead left 76. It's kind of significant and no one talked about it, but like Jeff Gardner. What was that? Yeah, he, he left about a month and a half ago. I was actually talking to him about some stuff. I wanted to see if I could interview him and, and chat with him a little bit, and we'll, we'll get that going at some point. But um, yeah, he left about a month and a half or two months ago uh, and moved on to something new. I don't know yet. Uh, but you know, that's the project lead for 76 that kind of helped guide it into the Wastelanders era where it's much better now. Um, oh. and, and he had left. And he had left. Wow. So, and they're releasing the pit thing, right? Yeah, they're releasing the pit thing. I imagine he had some some hand in that, but um, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's little... a pretty. You know, everyone always looks at like Bioware exits, Activision exits, and for good reason. But it's no one, no one at cares that. about seventy six. <laughs> yeah, honestly, now you mention it, because even I didn't think that's much of it at the moment. I was just like, you know, let me see if Jeff's cool to talk for a little bit. I'd love to just pick his brain about the the process of seventy six and all that stuff. And uh, we're we're gonna get something like that set up. But <laughs> I bet that's why. Like, I'm probably like one of yeah. two people who's like, oh, Jeff. Jeff left what, Bethesda Game Studios. When you we have content coming up for seventy six, and I could totally see them like not wanting to distract Fallout fans and like split them because mm -hmm. the moment new content comes out for something else, I you just know the people that are still playing that flocking. game. Some of them, yeah, are just walking. But you won't get that with Skyrim. People are still going to play Elder Scrolls Online. Mm -hmm. they, I, I don't know if that game's still getting content, but I'm assuming it is. Um, people will still be playing that. They're not going to move away from whatever they're doing because. Like the 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 Elder Scrolls series, I'd say is in a good state. You yeah. know, it's not in fall. It's not like dead in the water like Fallout. Yeah, we'll see. But I I think the only issue they have with what with them working out one for Fallout Four would probably be like Skyrim, the stars aligned, right? Like, okay, here we go. We've got this tenth uh, anniversary. Let's drop it then. Fallout Four. It's like, okay, what are you gonna wait four years? I mean, I guess maybe in the timeline it could make sense. Uh, you've got Starfield this year. And then probably Starfield DLC the following year. Then you've got a gap. And then maybe Fallout 4 then. That's and, so far, though. Yeah, like, right. At that point, I'm like, I don't know. Why not? Why? Maybe they just, if Starfield comes out in fall, why not do the Fallout 4? Well, I guess it'd be a little early, but Fallout 4 one in spring, summer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly doesn't need a long marketing period, but. Yeah, I'll be. I, see, that's the thing. I wish the games industry allowed more access to sales numbers. Like this would be one, especially. I'd love to know, like, why does Bethesda sell Skyrim again beyond of all of us accepting? Like, yeah, it's really popular. Like, how many copies do they sell of that for them to pull the trigger again? Like that data I, is so I desperately have, needed in our conversations all the time, and we never have access yeah, to it. I have to imagine with Skyrim, it's uh, besides marketing. I'd say it's probably low investment and high, like low risk because if it doesn't do well you what do you miss out you didn't create a brand new game yeah. you basically took content that's already existing and you're smacking it into like what what did they do for anniversary edition that made it like what would they have to sit down and really invest a lot of resources into you know what i mean like it's mm -hmm. not that that big of like a, a leap so i imagine for them it's like yeah this is a low investment that could make money that probably will net positive profits so why not yeah you know yeah why not, not going to damage our rep <laughs> that that's sort of how i see it but with fallout 4 like 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 you're saying it could be a little harder maybe mm -hmm. they would have to invest resources into it i don't know um but they've already upgraded skyrim so much that i i imagine it's in like this this pristine state where they don't really have to change anything yeah they just smack more content in that already exists mm -hmm. and then ship it out so yeah we got a super chat about skyrim uh Twenty dollars for Skyrim Special Edition upgrade is fine. This comes from what else? One. Wonder if it's included in Game Pass. It's not. That's the other interesting part. There's no Game Pass inclusion there, uh, which you kind of thought would happen after the acquisition. But it just, I think, again, goes to show that Bethesda will operate independently of Xbox as much as possible. And especially in this case, where it's like, yeah, you may own us, but you're not getting our upgraded ten-year-old game for free. Like they're cashing in on that. So. I, I feel as if Microsoft might have even had a hand in that too, because if it was on Game Pass, the sales would be way lower, in my opinion. Because yeah. because most most people, this is like literally off the dome. I don't know this for sure. I'd say most people who are playing Skyrim still might be playing it on Xbox, because that's always been the preferred place to play it, besides yeah, PC. For sure. Besides PC. So maybe like they they don't want to put it on Game Pass because it would lower sales. Mm. I don't know. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I think that's why they're taking the route of a discounted upgrade there because mm -hmm. it's like, well, you can get special edition through Game Pass and then you upgrade for 10 bucks. And that's a really easy way to get you and get them in the Game Pass. So maybe they're galaxy branding it a little bit. I don't know. So no sense in overthinking it. If you do it. that, if, if you're in Game Pass and you have special edition and you upgrade, do you keep it if you stop using Game Pass? Anniversary. Edition. I'm imagining if you are a Game Pass sub and I don't know. See, that's the thing. Again, the wording of this is so weird. I don't know if it's if you're a Game Pass sub and you have access to Skyrim Special Edition through Game Pass that if you upgrade, you now permanently have Anniversary Edition in your library. I hope so. Or if you are already a Game Pass sub and you own Skyrim Special Edition, like separately, whether it be physically or you bought it, downloaded it, then you can upgrade for that discounted price because you're a sub. Like they haven't explained that. If you can upgrade within the library, that's excellent because now you're effectively mm -hmm. getting Special Edition for what 15 bucks probably i'd imagine yeah tops if you're if you're and, game you pass sub and you yeah like that's great to see uh but if you have to buy it digitally and then buy it again i don't know we'll, we'll see on all of that it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how some of that some of that little stuff shakes out uh but nothing catastrophic i think that's good the, the worst has been avoided here yeah it's interesting how when, when we're getting like these upgraded versions of games how confusing it can be about like how you get access to this where it like like remember um Japanese swordsman game. Oh, uh, uh, Ghost of okay. Tsushima. Ghost of Tsushima. That was like so confusing, remember? And yeah. then the the worst one was Final Fantasy 7 Intermission. Oh my that god. That was insanely about confusing. That. Yeah, that that just like, made Xbox look good without even trying. Yeah. <laughs> like why why is it so hard to just be like, yeah, like just explain it simply and not have it be complex. I know it's not like the most simple process because you're shifting to a new generation and like right. there's different things that factor in but i feel like they're just poorly explaining it to everybody well it's not even that a poor explanation it's just lacking data like that's the thing it's just it's literally a clear lacking of information and and i think that's because they didn't think it out like it took us five seconds to be like wait i don't really get that but they just hit publish right away and that's either because this was done very last minute or again because they were like nervous of the price and it ended up going better than they thought which is entirely yeah. possible well, but with that, let's let's move on to our next bit of news. We got to talk about. Well, hold on, hold on. Oh, sorry, go for it. We have to remember. We have to taste test the uh... right. Just, just real quick, right? Real quick. No, no, no. Of course, that's I... important. That's important. Which one am you I drinking? You have to understand. Uh, you're gonna do both again, and you're gonna you're gonna compare. Okay. We got a we got ice, and then you have your uh... yeah. Let's do ice here. Ugh, water. You know what? That ice actually didn't hit too. That was that was not bad. Let's see. Mine was mine was horrendous. Okay. I still think the no ice is a lot, a, not a lot, a little better, but something happened there chemically that I'd love to investigate. We should get Your a chemist on this show. You to be right. No Your brain wants you to be right here. I'll, I'll take another sip. I'll take another sip. That's fine. Okay. I'll take another sip. Because for me, ice was immediately worse than last time, and no mm -hmm. ice was. I know what's happening. I don't need to take another sip. I know what's happening. What I liked about that was when the, the ice one hit my tongue, it was cooler. I had a different sensation there. Okay. The ice has made this drink remain colder for longer. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, it's a little more wet on the outside. Whereas the drink to the left, which is the one without ice, is more bubbly. So that's why they felt like they hit the same. So time mm. is a factor here. This is, Absolutely. This is interesting. I would never do this for school, but I would do this for my own show. The the main thing you got to remember, you can get a metal cup, like one of the Turbis, tur I don't know what they're called, Yetis. You never have to worry about ice. Um, That's fair. But yeah, I, I noticed that the, the ice was definitely colder. And I, I honestly, I'll, I'll shift my ground a little bit. It is nice that it's a little colder. Yeah. But there's, there's something about the, the, the temperature yeah. there, but it's an overtime thing. Like immediately upon taking them out of the fridge, what, what like five, 10 minutes later? Mm -hmm. I, I do think that the the non ice won, but maybe it's. I think it, to me, time. non ice still wins because at the end of the day, I don't want to drink flat soda. Yes, that's watered down. That's true, <laughs> but but I I can I can uh, see your side a little bit, and I do see that's how right. just being a little bit colder is nicer than this. I mean, this is already getting closer to room temperature, and it's like a little flat. No, no, not flat at all, honestly. But okay. the ice is flat. But, uh, the ice is definitely flat. <laughs> Dog shit fucking soda. Don't drink it. <laughs> All right. Let's talk Obsidian. Bethesda's older brother 
who's working on another new RPG. So we've talked about Obsidian a lot lately. And the reason I kept them out of the headline is because I know we've been talking about them a lot. But things for mm -hmm. them just continue to leak. So we know Grounded 1.0 coming out next year. Uh, that's going to be the full game for Grounded, and they'll build off of that. Then we know that we have apparently Avowed in 2023. We've heard that The Outer Worlds 2 is 2024. What's interesting now is we have learned more about the Josh Sawyer RPG. Mm -hmm. And Josh Sawyer, for those who don't know, spearheaded Fallout New Vegas. He spearheaded the likes of Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2. And he is a RPG mastermind. So these details come from Jeff Grubb. If you're listening to this when the episode is live and free for everybody, uh, just know that I have a conversation with Jeff Grubb that's going out on Saturday, or it will have already been out. Um, and it's us just sitting down chatting about, uh, about this Obsidian leak and just getting some more details on it. Uh, what I wanted to do with that, for those who are wondering about the purpose of that content, was trying to bridge the gap between YouTube and press in a meaningful way, where instead of doing what a lot of YouTubers do, which is taking the news and re-reporting it, which I'll still do because I don't, I can't just put, flag these guys down uh, every single time that they have information to share. Uh, but trying to bridge that gap where instead of, you know, reiterating what's been said and giving my thoughts, which I'll still do, extending the conversation to them and getting more info on it and getting their perspective on it. And, and again, adding more to that, that leak, if you will, and, and seeing what we can get out of them. Uh, and Jeff was down. He was great. So that'll be up on the channel. If you have yet to check it out. I'm really excited about that because it'll sort of be a proof of concept to send to other people who break stories, like maybe Jez Corden or something like that. So keep an eye out for that. Or if you have not seen it already, check it out. Uh, now let's talk about Josh Sawyer's Obsidian game details, which he shared on Grub Snacks, or which uh, Jeff's shared on Grub Snacks. Sorry, it focuses on experimental mechanics and interactions. It's still being developed by a small team. It's a 16th century European setting. It will have no combat, or at least it's still planned to. Murder mystery RPG. You'll be investigating a murder by talking to people and building a case. You can accuse people of murder. You will possibly continue to play even if you get it wrong and see the consequences. And it's planned to come out 2022. What do you think of this? I actually really like the sounds of it. I So the first thing I did was I did some research into the 16th century. And that setting is insane. All right. Mm. I, have, I have some stuff pulled up here, Matt. Tell me about it. We, have, we have the Colombian Exchange. Uh, mm. which is uh, Christopher Columbus. You know, he discovered discovered the new world, America. Um, and some other stuff like Galileo. So you have the, the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for here? The, the Earth-centric solar system being shifted. Now it's more solar-centric. Um, thermometers being invented. So a lot of like scientific advancements, but also the, the full mm. map. The whole map of, of, this, of the world yeah. <laughs> is being discovered. Um, so I think that's a really interesting setting. Now, it's in Europe, so I don't think we'll be going to the Americas. But the fact that that's something that will be people are being talked about, that's something that's going on in this world at this time, is really interesting. It has no combat. Mm -hmm. And it, remember, it, remember we read it was very art-driven? Yeah. So do you... I, 16th century, no combat, art-driven? I'm kind of liking this. This sounds really yeah. like... Terrible. And exciting yeah I, i'm very excited about it because this is coming hot off the tail of murder murder on iridanos which was not directed or anything by uh josh sawyer but this was a murder mystery rpg experience from obsidian and while the combat in the outer worlds is there i can promise you that's not the best part of that dlc at all in fact at times i don't even know if it needed to exist the story the way it built up uh the way you would discover clues was way more interesting and so to see them carry that forward effectively in a full game is really exciting. I'd almost forgotten about the art driven part of all of this. But when I talked to Jeff, uh, the kind of inkling I got was they felt pretty confident moving forward with this, of course, with Microsoft in tow, but also because of Disco Elysium, because I had asked him about that. I said, mm -hmm. this reminds me of Disco Elysium, where you kind of played as this shitty detective in that case, who is trying to solve a mystery and... And that's really all there is. There's no combat, uh, but you're skill checking your way through things. It's like a very fun game in a not conventional manner. And that's sort of the vibe that he's got from this and that you can kind of tell from reading the details. So if anyone wants something comparable, check out Disco Elysium. I have yet to play it, but that seems like a good place to look. And, and again, what's great about this is 
we're seeing Xbox's impact in a in a particular way where we're going to see companies take chances that normally wouldn't be taken. I love that though. I think I I, I know you do too, but yeah. That's just so exciting because now we're going to get deviations from the norm. We're going to see things that might not work, might work. And this sounds like something like if you presented this to to like a company that, you know, is just trying to make some money and wanting to play it safe, play into trends, they'd probably deny it. But Microsoft, like giving up City and that free reign, that's what I love about these acquisitions. I know like there's a lot of negatives to them, mm-hmm. but the acquisitions are good because it gives like companies that might not have a support beam a support beam and they can really experiment and try something new yeah. and bring something that they've always wanted to try or maybe it's just a spur of the moment thing but that's that's what like game development good games that's what i, I think where they come from like with near you know near's very experimental kind of out there yeah but but you, they gave yoko taro his chance and like look it paid off immensely so i'm i love that this is happening now perfect example too with yoko taro because he's the mm-hmm. shining beacon of let someone experiment and see what happens because Automata sells like 4 million copies because it's so out there, but also so profound and thought provoking, Mm. but also fun. Even though I think the combat's like the weakest part of that game, it shows how much a story can carry. But what's great is it also shows an internal recognition by Obsidian to say, hey, we've got a Vowed working. We've got the Outer Worlds 2 on the way. Like we clearly have our big ones. Like we clearly are making games that should be our, I put this in quotes, big sellers, our, our big marketable titles, which based off Jess Corden's reporting and what we've seen in the first Outer Worlds, these big first person RPGs, right? Whether they be hub based or open world, we'll see. Uh, but those are the more marketable games. What I like is that they're not doing this Activision trimming of teams, all hands on deck on the two big ones. You're seeing grounded. You're seeing whatever Josh Sawyer is working on. We know Kerry Patel is directing something. There's another project under development there at Obsidian. They're letting these smaller teams splinter off and chase their passion with the money that Microsoft's giving them, the money that they have internally. And that's very, very good. Number one for diversity in Game Pass, which we already know exists. Uh, but also, again, for the culture that the company is building, people will want to work there. It, it, it mm-hmm. looks very attractive to be like, hey, if you have a good enough idea we're going to let you go off and chase it, right? And Mm -hmm. I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but Josh Sawyer, I'd say, has a lot of sway, right? Like, he directed New Vegas. Like, I think he has a lot of power to be like, yeah, I'm going to go fucking do this, all right? And uh, kiss my ass if you think otherwise. But someone like, I think, uh, Adam Brennicky, who directed Grounded, like, again, not to be disrespectful, but I had never heard of Adam until uh, he was directing Grounded. But it seems like he's very capable because Grounded was great when it came out, and it's only gotten better. Uh, so it shows that Obsidian's willing to a- elevate, you know, new talent and uh, mm-hmm. bring them up the chain and let them again chase those passions. So th- we're kind of seeing their the the best version of Obsidian right now, where they used to be the lovable janky RPG machine. Uh, you'd get something wild like South Park Stick of Truth, which they took from like multiple developers and made into something very good. Uh, you get a New Vegas, which is you know a blueprint of Fallout Three, but evolved and better in a lot of ways. Uh, you get Pillars of Eternity, you get Tyranny, uh, which I know Carrick really loved Tyranny. You get these all these different games from them, uh, but now you're seeing them splinter off, do new fun things, and uh, have the funding and the confidence to do so. So, very yeah, excited about it, this. It's interesting because I remember when we were getting all, like a wave of acquisitions. You had Obsidian, and you had Bethesda, right? And um, everybody was like, <laughs> I just I, I took a I, like, I was, did there. yeah I was gonna say I tried I, to take a little sip and I literally paid the price I'd stand up and show everybody but it's all over my nuts like well I, what I was I gonna say is you failed myself with, you said you weren't gonna be taking any more I know sips. I was gonna do it kind of to like egg you on but also because yeah. I wanted to sip and oh fuck it's in my hoodie too sorry go on I completely did, you go, did you go for ice or did you go for normal no that was normal that's why I don't get what happened wow. there I don't sorry please continue <laughs> I did not mean to distract there what what I was saying is I feel like Obsidian is actually the more valuable purchase now. Like I, I originally we had thought Bethesda. I still do think Bethesda is valuable, but like mm-hmm. with all this stuff coming out from Obsidian, from a consumer standpoint, yeah, definitely. Even, I was gonna say that. I feel like this is like this is a lot more interesting, and and I'm more excited for this than a lot of. The, like, I'm more excited to see everything Obsidian is working on than I am for Starfield. I know it's not the same for you, but no, but I get where you're coming just, from for sure. 
Yeah, because like this is this is uh th they're given that chance, you know, and mm -hmm. I think if we if we had that more around the industry, we would have more bangers. So yeah. that's uh really really exciting. Yeah, and I like that it's something new in the RPG space. We certainly see mm -hmm. a lot of you know slap in this skill tree here, do this over there, and it, it can get redundant. I think there's a, a a what is the word I'm looking for attraction to the classic rpg approach and you can still do a classic rpg approach nowadays but like dedicating it to being an rpg like nowadays we just see people watering down rpgs by borrowing their mechanics and putting them in open world games and putting them into action adventure games where they really don't belong uh, it's like the pseudo rpg yeah exactly right? it's always like a subtitle to something else it's like not just we're making an rpg but again like open world rpg or action rpg like it always devalues it in some way so i'm happy to see that they're making a fun new i shouldn't say fun but a new type of rpg it's a fun idea Definitely. i'd say like that's like fair like you can say it's a fun i mean that setting is like there's just a ton of stuff going on that's like a massive point of advancement for mm -hmm. human humanity as a whole so yeah. the fact that they, they chose that i imagine they have an idea already as to what this murder mystery is going to be about like they probably were thinking this is something we want to explore because it can help deliver an interesting story. Right. Um, so I don't know. And come to think of it, I really don't know if we've had a game set in the 16th century. Like I'm sure there is, but like one that is like really I'm trying to remember Assassin's Creed Kingdom, Three, maybe Kingdom Come Deliverance was I want to say 13th. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't recall. It's been a while. It was maybe like someone in ago. chat. If someone in chat will help us it. out, but. Um, I'm very excited for this. And 2022, by the way. Like, that's the other yeah. thing. I, I asked Jeff when in late? 2022, and he, he said probably second half. Okay. Probably second half. So, um, not too far off, but that kind of... When you start to shake out Xbox's 2022 lineup to, to look at it more broadly, it's like you get a little thing like this. You see Redfall, Starfield, Stalker 2, stuff like Somerville. Their 2022 is filling out very quickly. Xbox is killing it. They're doing a really good job, man. I'm 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 yeah. hyped for them because you know mm -hmm. they're have the chance to to put the cherry on top this fall with Halo Infinite. We'll see if they actually do that. Um, I have confidence now that I think they will, based off what I've seen of the campaign and of course the multiplayer really speaks for itself. Um, yeah. So so fingers crossed that they they can really keep this ball rolling and get that Sony like momentum where when they release something or their names attached to it. Uh, there's a value there. I don't think it'll ever be as strong um, a, as a PlayStation because Xbox with Game Pass is going to be attached to way more games than than mm -hmm. PlayStation. You know what I mean? Like they're they're going to be getting day one stuff there. Like their hands going to be in the cookie jar more often, just yeah, sheerly based off that machine. Um, where I don't know if it'll be that level, but I'm hoping when like they have a Hellblade coming around, a Vowed coming around, there is that level of hype that we're seeing for halo infinite like that level of conversation the willingness I to get involved starfield, seeing starfield at e3 or if we even see it before but i think we'll see it at e3 it's gonna be like fall four where you see it at e3 and then it comes out that year and that's it yeah right because that works well for bethesda and i think more companies should be kind of jumping on that train <laughs> but um yeah i think we'll see that and then we're really gonna see xbox sort of shine mm -hmm. and i wonder how sony's gonna respond because yeah. we have games coming out from them we have uh, God of War, Horizon, we have, uh, Forspoken. Horizon. Um, this is another one. Forspoken, probably. For no, oh, another one after that. Oh, never mind. It's it's like a hypothetical, but Blue Point might have something. Mm. You know. So, um, I'm interested because after that, I don't know what Sony's going to be working on, but we can look into the future of Xbox a little bit more. Yes, absolutely, and and. What's happening now is we're just seeing three strong brands. Like Nintendo's fucking annoying, but they're doing well and and they've got fun <laughs> stuff coming out at times. PlayStation remains strong and Xbox is now getting strong. So, mm -hmm. uh it's just really refreshing to see all three thriving at the same time. And I hope it continues. I really do. Like I hope it lasts a very long while uh cuz I just remember little things feeling unattainable in video games. Like when I was playing on 360 and PS3, I remember like I thought lip sync being perfected was not going to be possible. There was always like a graininess to the, to the imaging, uh, the image quality of mm -hmm. those games. And like now it's been cleaned up. It's crisp. Like playing something such as Forza Horizon 5 and seeing how clean it looks, man. I know it's a graphical showcase, but like, again, it looks so well, even, ridiculously even good. Even that aren't graphical showcases like... Uh... 
I guess Ratchet and Clank. I mean, it kind of is, but it's also like, you know. Yeah, it's, it's its own. I, I think it, of like Guardians it, of the Galaxy. Like that wasn't a graphical showcase, but it still looked good. And like the motion capture was brilliant. Like they did a really good job with that game. And I'm, I just, I feel like games have headed in such a positive direction, despite what a lot of people have said. So I'm, I'm just happy to see that it, it, these companies are doing well. It's cool because we're exiting like, and this is sort of like more social, but we're exiting like the pandemic, you know. And like a lot of people, this is sort of like a historical thing, but after like a really bad time, mm-hmm. you get like a really, really good time, like a golden age, yeah. if you will. Yeah. I feel like gaming almost is like entering like this this unique golden age um, that we haven't seen for a little bit. So yeah, next year I, has I'm, the uh, chance to deliver big time. Yeah, I'm super stoked. I mean, this year was underwhelming for a lot of people. I, I found it as a great year to chug through my backlog and try games I've never played before that I've always wanted to. So it wasn't really bad for me, but, and it's not really bad, but there have, it's been a slower year. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we haven't had massive bangers. A lot of people are tossing around their game of the year because it, there's not really a definitive one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like I, next year the, it'll be a lot harder because there's so many games that are going to be coming out. I think and, and, what's going to happen is a lot of people forgot that feeling when you play a game and you just kind of like, no, this is a, a game mm-hmm. of the year contender. I, I think there have been, I, I'm sorry, I know some people will disagree because everyone's got their different opinions, but I really think there's been a lacking of a universally beloved title this year. Uh, and I don't think there's much arguing that point, but really what I mean is that feeling of everyone's looking for something to be good. So we're seeing, I think, a lot of higher review scores almost compensating for the desire to have something yeah. good. Where, for example... And I know this is going to look biased, but just hear me out. I look at Deathloop, and then I look at what's coming next year and the potential that is hidden within next year for games we, didn't even, we don't even know about. And I think in hindsight, that 10 that's been given to Deathloop so many times yeah. is going to look very strange when we start to look at games that truly do have that game of the year 10 out of 10 quality. Again, if you like Deathloop, you love it, you think it is a 10, I'm not bashing you, but I just think that we're in a weird time right now where almost like people are looking for something to be yeah. that defining game I, when it's not I totally there yet. Agree. I saw some takes on death loop where it was so, it was such a stretch. And like, I, I'm not afraid to say like, if you like death loop, that's great. I think it's kind of like painfully mediocre from um, a studio like that. And like, I saw some takes, I think there was one that I just totally, totally disagreed with. It was a game journalist take. And it was like, <laughs> it's a game journalist. Uh, take. <laughs> it, well, just cause it came from a game journalist. Nah, I know what you mean. But yeah, it was like Deathloop is a game that people were going to be looking at and taking notes from for years to come. I didn't like, see any. I, that, I remember seeing none that. Of that at all. Yeah. Like, that is, just, and I think that's sort of what you're getting at. Like this sort of desire to find something that's like people are like, you know that there's like a picture and it's like two people mining on top of each other mm-hmm. and like there's a wall and there's all the diamonds behind it and the other yeah. guy there's more and then the diamonds yeah it's like people are just digging and they want to find those diamonds they want to find those good games i know and it's just, yeah they're big it's good like, games there just hasn't been that game there hasn't been i feel like I, I just for me i have had that game but it was it takes two mm-hmm. and the only reason i say that is because the innovation it's just it's it's so good sure you have to play it. yeah and i think that's totally fair because that does look yeah. very different there's nothing like it takes two that came out this year so that makes sense yeah. right but we've seen arcane do what they've done for a number yeah. of years and I could go on about just really inflated review scores that have come out. Like, you know, I think you could almost like, I, I'm surprised that, for example, I really liked Psychonauts 2 a lot, but I was surprised that people were talking like game of the year for that one. Dude, now, Hot Wheels was a game I reviewed and people were like, that's a perfect like example, hyping yeah. it up. And I'm like, this game's like really above average, like, or even average. Like, it's not that good at all. Yeah. So I was. It, I, I agree with you there. We're seeing a lot of outlets sort of just like, I feel like if if most average things sit like a six to seven point five, mm-hmm. those that's been, that window has been shifted to like seven to nine. I yeah. really think that. No, I, kind of, you're totally right. You're totally right. Mm-hmm. There's definitely been. Oh, there's going to be next year a controversy around review scores. Like, there's no doubt in my mind because there's just been yeah. so much overextension this year in my eyes of games that were okay that got a bump i'm not even talking death loop mm-hmm. at this point like I, I think bio mutant was one that that a lot of people were like overly forgiving of it's just a team of 20 people it's like it didn't work 
wasn't a good game. Yeah. Like it, it, that's all there is to it. it. Doesn't need an eight. Doesn't need a seven. It wasn't that. It wasn't close to that. And I think because we're seeing these overextension of scores, when you start to see next year where I think the average will go up just by nature of the games that are coming out. Like we're going to see more sevens and eights. People are going to look retroactively at these scores we saw in 2021 and be like, what the fuck are you giving like bio mutant yeah. a seven for? And you just gave Elden ring an eight. Like you're saying bio mutants one point, And that's an issue with the number <laughs> review score, but I'm telling you, it's going to blow up in the face of a lot of these outlets next year. They're just there. It's a product of the numbers review score system, but People got to be careful. I mean, that's that's why, like, if you look at my reviews, there's a lot of games I'm like, wait for a sale. Like, I think I had, like, five wait for a sales in a row. Outside of Tales of Arise, like, I think that and Forza Horizon 5 have been my only, like, go out and buy it this fall. Everything else mm -hmm. has been, like, you can wait. You can really wait. Uh, but there have been some severely overrated games this year, for sure. Four Eyes Malone pointed something out in the chat that I think I agree with, and it's that gamers really want those 10 out of 10 experiences. And like I, I totally agree with that because like we have like a mutual friend mm -hmm. who I won't name, but you know who I'm talking about. Who it just has to be blown away. Like they have to play something, and it just has to knock their socks off. And if it doesn't, they're dropping it, or like they, they're like inflate the how they feel about it because they think it was like a ten out of ten. Mm -hmm. And I think that I, I can see that sort of being like a collective thing in like the games and media. Yeah, where people I never know who we're talking about. Yeah, there's also. On that note, I've said this before. We talked about this last week, I believe. There, there's also just the idea that that the press, people have to, <clears throat> pardon me, I choked on water. People have to know, be very aware. The press likes shorter games. They will give mm -hmm. a game a higher score because they like the game being shorter. Know that. Be very cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I say that is because the industry is growing up together. So the journalists that you've been following for five, 10 years are getting older. Some of them have kids now. Some of them have more responsibilities. They're more attracted to these experiences. It's why you want to seek out the young guys. Like, again, it's why I wanted Kopi on the show. Like, you want that younger perspective because not everyone's looking for the easy way out. And even if you're older. The future is now, old man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing is you're going to see. That's why, like, Metroid Dread was so controversial. I thought that was a phenomenal game. Like, that was a game I agreed with the scores on. But it got a bump for a lot of people uh, because of its length. So just again, be aware of, of the review system because it's a very, it's very warped now, I think. And it's kind of unfortunate. Deathloop is actually another game that was really short and like, yeah, you sort of, you, you did not, that makes sense. I didn't really think about that, but yeah. And part of the reason I explain why, like, it's not only because, Oh, um, they're, they're older and they don't have as much time, but it's also the crunch that these game journalists have to go through. Like, yes I've, I've done i've done reviews you've done them yeah you've had like point. reviews like a few weeks ago you were reviewing like two or three games right and mm -hmm. you couldn't play anything but that game those games mm -hmm. um and you they get the they'll get a game and you have a certain amount of days to review it or play through it and review it so you don't have time like that refraction or reflection period after um you have to get down and write your review like i finished forza in the same day that i wrote out my review mm -hmm. and um that's just, it's like an unfortunate thing of the games journalism industry. And it's good that sometimes you'll get uh, studios who give out games early, like a month earlier. Yeah. I think like, that's perfect. But even some games, like a month isn't enough. Mm -hmm. Persona 5 Royal. Yeah. But that game got fly flying scores. So it's, it's, that's a little bit different. But yeah, it, it's not just because like, oh, they, they don't have time. It's like sometimes they really have to crunch through this stuff. Um, and I thought I sort of feel like that's also why the scores might sort of get inflated a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really do believe the how how much you have to play through a game, how much you have to grind it, in sort of uh, it impacts the score. how you feel. Yeah, in in a positive or negative way. Because I remember Replicant. Um, I you have to beat that game like three or four times near replicant yeah. just to get like, and we both grinded through it and I enjoyed it for my first playthrough and my second. But then like when you want to get that true ending, it really, really dampens the experience and it can soil the whole thing through. Mm -hmm. And it's sad. Um, that's why so yeah. many games that they finish on a high note. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's it. We could go on. We should just have like a dedicated segment to it at some point in time. Take some, yeah. some audience questions in on that. But, uh, Let's move on to the next bit of news here. Let's talk about Bioware because they had a, a pretty interesting development here that I didn't really expect from them. So as many know, they've been working on Star Wars The Old Republic for about a decade now. 
Uh, there's a new expansion coming out this fall or holiday period. They haven't told us when. Um, it's called Legacy of the Sith. And the reason I wanted to cover this is because they have confirmed and renewed their commitment saying that they have no plans to end the Old Republic anytime soon. Um, this comes from PC Gamer. They said chatting with creative director Charles Boyd about the uh, Old Republic's impending 10-year anniversary. I was hoping he'd say Bioware was almost done with the MMO because I'm craving a sequel. I always wanted new, shinier things, but the team has, quote, no plans to stop anytime soon, end quote, because there are more stories and sci-fi crises to come. It does feel like things are building up to some sort of conclusion. He says Malgus has returned, has been around since the start. He's probably our most recognizable villain. You know, he was first introduced in those CG trailers before the game even launched. So now with it coming around 10 years, kind of coming full circle, maybe that could happen and there could be some type of closure for Malgus, whatever that might mean. That could be a reasonable guess. So it's less about the lore and whatnot, but Swotor, again, having its commi the commitment renewed by Bioware is a sign that they're going to go hard with the Old Republic in the coming years. I've been telling people like, uh, probably through two years now that star Wars has been gearing up to do a whole old Republic push like across TV movies um, and games. As we know with games, there's been announcements for that. Uh, we know there was a movie trilogy that was leaked. Uh, and so the reason I think this is going to stay alive is because they are probably going to see a bump here. And not only that, but I feel like now if they're ever going to bring this to console, which they have yet to. If they're ever going to bring it to console, now is the time. Now is the time. Um, so what do you think right now, just early thoughts on Bioware sticking with the old Republic, keeping their MMO alive, even though it's been 10 years and not moving on to something else? Um, so I don't play a lot of the old Republic actually at all, but I do think that um, if they were moving on, they they would have an opportunity to sort of steal the attention away from Final Fantasy XIV. Mm -hmm. You know, you know how like MMOs, it's like a almost like a hive mind of people who play them, and they're focusing on one thing, and then they'll shift it, and they'll shift it. like it was WoW. Now it's yeah. Final Fantasy XIV. So if they came out and made like another game, they they would have that opportunity. But I think if the wheel's not broken, then don't fix it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you play a lot of. Swotor, you do it like annually, right? During December or whatever. Yeah, and we've been and, playing it most of this year. On yeah, and, and so like, how do you, how do you feel as someone who plays it? Do you think this is good, or would you prefer something new? Um, I'm looking forward to the new Legacy of the Sith expansion. That's what got me back into it because they were like, we're increasing the level cap, we're renewing how combat works. They're testing it in the PTS as we speak. So I imagine they'll give it a release date soon once the balancing for that is tweaked properly. For me personally, I sit on the side offensively. Like, I think this is actually good news and bad news. Like I think it's good because I'm happy that we're getting more of the Old Republic. I'm happy that they haven't given up on it because out of any MMO that's on the market right now, the Old Republic hands down bar none, not even because I love that era of Star Wars, but just its presentation alone and its writing uh, does storytelling in MMO better than anyone else out there. Um, not that others are bad, just I think the way it's presented in SWOTOR is excellent. It's top tier. And so I'm happy to see that hang around. I'm happy to experience more of those stories. Um, I'm going to probably pick it up soon once I'm done with my Halo marathon and just kind of start chipping through it again to get ready for uh, this expansion and, and just refamiliarize myself. Uh, but the bad news here is I am kind of in agreement with the person who had talked with uh, Bioware on PC Gamer on how I was kind of ready for something new, a refresh. Uh, almost like a Fantasy Star Online 2 New Genesis, where Fantasy Star Online 2 was good, but it felt very old. Then New Genesis came out, and one of our friends hated Fantasy Star Online 2. He's like so against it, he uninstalled it when I was in the middle of playing. For those of you who listen to Ham Radio Podcast, <laughs> know. you'll know I flamed everyone who did that to me because I was very upset about that. I was still there. I didn't yeah, leave. You, 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 you hung in there with me. And uh, you weren't as a fan. As bad as it was. Yeah, you hung in there. <laughs> But then New Genesis comes around, and we we got to the end game right away. There wasn't as much content as I'd like, but it was a really, really fun game. It was really enjoyable. And that refresher um, got me back in, uh, and it got a lot of people back in. People didn't even like it. So I feel like SWOTOR could really benefit from that level of a refresher. I would love to see them do something like that um, on the level of New Genesis. And that's kind of the bad news. It's like, okay, you're going to stick with it, but like it already feels and looks old, but... Now we're talking like what happens when it's 2024 
what does this game look like? What happens when the yeah. Old Republic remake comes out? What is it going to look like then? A uh, lot of lot of things worth looking at there. But yeah, I'm um I'm personally still anticipating more smoke to our content for obvious reasons. I was going to say that like when I do get into MMO like games, the sort of games as a service in general, it has to be for me most of the time when the game launches. Like I've been grinding Genshin Impact since its launch. Um, I've been playing it a little less recently nowadays, uh, but I do play it a lot. And part of why I was able to get into it is because like if I'm here, the content is here. As I'm playing, I'm with the content. But mm -hmm. when I jump into something where the content's all the way over here, like Final Fantasy fourteen, to get to the good stuff, I got to trudge through 100 hours of okay stuff. Yeah. And I don't know if um, the Old Republic is like that, but the fact that there's so much content there is already like so daunting to me as someone who doesn't have as much time to play games as someone who grinds mmos i play like a variety of games as most people do mm -hmm. so when i'm trying to play through a bunch of different games with an mmo you just have to stick with it and you gotta yeah. play it nightly and a few hours every night chip away at it so that's what's they so did great an... about spotor sorry to interrupt you just that's what's great about it is is there number one i think the content in the base game is good before you even get to the expansions and I don't think there is that level of FOMO that a lot of games really feed and prey off of, which is why I'm kind of surprised they're just hanging with it as it is. Yeah, I, I there's a lot of stuff in that game I want to see. Like I know Revan makes an appearance or even has his own like expansion. Yeah, yeah I think that's DLC. So cool. But I do agree. Like when we see the the Kotor remake and how good that looks, and we're gonna be looking at old republic and like oh if we want more kotor we have to go to this really game yeah you know? yeah and like it, it my, probably isn't that bad if you if you look at it like especially if you compare it to the original kotors um kotor one and two which i think has aged pretty poorly i know you disagree but i think kotor oh, yeah, one <laughs> go, going back to kotor one is very hard i think kotor two is a little better although i never finished it <laughs> which I, I need to and by the way matt i, I was thinking about that last night kotor yeah, two time. is yeah, within, I don't want to say by the end of the year, but within like the first quarter of 2022, I'm going to be getting through that game. I think I, once you get off of, you probably trails. use the mod to skip the Paragus station, I imagine. Yeah, I can do that because I already did it. Yeah, and you already my game bugged out. I have, for those of you who don't know, I've started KOTOR 2 this year and what happened was um it kept bugging out and i don't remember what exactly was happening like my menus would get messed up matt i was streaming it to you so you know yeah there was like it was it was really oddly buggy yeah. like it was I, I forgot exactly what was happening too I, I think we could like see through the walls like the the environments yeah. weren't loading properly your equipment was and being held wrong like it was broken it was like a bad install it looked like uh, yeah it was either a bad install or the mods it's not the problem like it's not the game's fault because i know the game isn't really that buggy on, on its own but what well, without the was, mod, it actually is. That's the funny part. It, it, is it really? Yeah, it's a pretty buggy game. That's why that mod I made you. Steam? Yeah, I made you install the restored content mod because it fixes a lot of the bugs. So that's why I was like really oh. flabbergasted by how much yeah. of a buggy experience you were having because it was it was never not never like that, it but it's usually not like that. Load order or something. But when I what I was playing, I was like kind of I was really hooked because mm. the, that intro to me was like really enticing. Yeah, it's atmospheric um, as fuck. Station, I love it. Atmospheric, really creepy. You have like, I think there's two characters that you are introduced. Yeah, to. yeah, Atten and uh, Kraya. Yeah, and like it was really really grabbing, but I just couldn't get through it because it kept bugging out on me. Right, I got I to you. the point where the Republic ship showed up. I think that's yeah, that's that's. To... Did you board the Republic ship? Do you remember? So do you see Darth Sion, like the guy who was like standing there in the dark? I, I think I did. I'm not oh, sure. That's like the best did. part, in my opinion, because then you start fighting cloaked Sith troopers, and it's like it's like so creepy. It's like the one part of Star Wars I think is legitimately like a little terrifying. It's loaded with atmosphere. Like there's no because the thing is, is the Endar Spire. You start off on this like in the first game, this you know loud orchestra. And it's all yeah. like rah rah war, you know, Republic versus Sith. And then when you get on a Republic ship for the first time in Kotor two, it's like no one's there, everyone's yeah. dead, and like something and, creepy uh, escaped. Yeah, this game um, immediately just has a really different feel from one. Uh, mm -hmm. We're kind of deviating, but I just want to point out, like, right at the very beginning of the game, you play as T three, and like you have to save everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, I just love that. It yeah. was so cool. Yeah. So I I do want to return to it, and I do plan to. Good. That's all I had. To Good. 
I will walk you through it if need be. Yeah. Well, we'll fix the, the mods. Yeah. So it doesn't that doesn't out. take long anyway. So we can do that mm-hmm. like sometime in Discord. All right. Last bit of news. This one uh, I thought was fascinating. Square Enix throws Crystal Dynamics right under the fucking bus without a second thought. Addressing shareholders in a statement published in the company's annual report, President Yosuke Matsuda said Square Enix needed to learn from the game's disappointing performance. He highlighted the importance of matching development studios with game designs that best suit their skill sets and interests. Avengers developer Crystal Dynamics is best known as the studio behind Tomb Raider, and their next project is collaborating with Microsoft on Perfect Dark. Quote, Marvel's Avengers was an ambitious title for us that we took in the games as a service model. We overcame a variety of unexpected difficulties in the final phase of the game's development, including needing to transition from work from home due to the pandemic. We were able to surmount these challenges and release the game, but it has not proven as successful as we would have liked. Nonetheless, taking on the games as a service model highlighted issues that we are likely to face in future game development efforts, such as the need to select game designs that mesh with unique attributes and tastes of our studios and development teams. While the new challenge that we tackled with this title produced a disappointing outcome, we are certain that the games as a service approach will grow in importance as games become more service oriented. How we go about creating those new experiences by incorporating this trend into our game design is a key question that we will need to answer going forward. End quote. Wow. <sighs> I, I, I kind of see a lot this of This is really shitty. Okay, yeah. So I think because I, I agree it is shitty. Like they kind of threw them under the bus. Their team probably doesn't feel good being called like disappointing. This doesn't fit. But, and I know this sounds a little cutthroat. He's not wrong. And anyone who is looking from the outside in could tell that the company that made Tomb Raider was not going to make you a good games as a service title. Like that was obvious. But But, what this says to me is that they saw an opportunity to make money and they disregarded probably what Crystal Dynamics wanted to do and said like, mm -hmm. this has to be a service title. And that's on Square Enix. So that's the one unfair part in my opinion is you've blamed them for what looks to be based off your wording here, your own decision. Um, right. by, by saying well, we matched the wrong talent with the wrong type of game. It's like, no, it just shouldn't have been probably they didn't want to make a game as a service title and it shouldn't have been that in the first place. So that's where the bullshit lies. But I think that they're right. This w- should not have happened. It, it did not work out. And I hope they learn from it because it cratered them big time financially. But what were so you going to say? You called it shitty. Well, yeah, I, I agree it with everything you said. And that's sort of what I was going to say, although I was going to kind of be a heavier on Square Enix and... The- it's really like a, a p- pushing up pushing the blame situation like if you're if you're um, working with a studio or you own a studio or whatever you you, you acquired them you just you just got to be like you got got to have good relations there like we were talking about Obsidian and Microsoft giving them the ability to play make what they want mm-hmm. and this to me is just like a, an actual example of a poor relationship or at least a poor rapport you know what i mean like you're looking at Crystal Dynamics and you're saying, yeah, what you guys guys did was disappointing. Well, you made them make a games as a service game for a game that shouldn't have been games as a service, a game that should have just been like a, a Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it wasn't, and it was totally different. And it's because Square Enix wanted to make money. Disney wanted to make money with this, and they pumped they pumped a lot of money into Avengers, and they picked a studio that wasn't a good fit. But in my opinion, like, you just shouldn't have made it a games as a service game in the first place. And Crystal Dynamics definitely shouldn't have been the studio to handle that. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't, if they weren't tailoring it to games as a service, I think Crystal Dynamics would have done a a, a fine job. But unfortunately, you have Square Enix here, and I'm assuming Disney up there, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Ring that bell. We got to make that money because Marvel Avengers, like, that name alone is huge. Like, that is the game. Like, it's the, the Avengers game. And... They fucked it up. Yeah. And wasn't that like one of the most, the highly, I'm trying to word myself here. Avengers cost a lot of money compared to a lot of other games. Yeah. Right? It, it like damaged, a lot it, of money. it damaged them financially big time because they invested in it, expecting it to be like a cash cow with the cosmetics. Mm-hmm. And I get why they had that expectation, but you could smell the bad from a mile away when we first saw it. And it's interesting because yeah. now when you look at this wording combined with what I said in my review, I was like, you could tell. This was a single player game at first because it's running like a single player game. It's okay. Mm-hmm. It's never blowing your socks off. But then you get to this map 
and you start to see them like dot the map in this uh, Avengers station with all these different little missions you can go out on. And I'm like, what the fuck is this, man? This looks nothing yeah. like what I was just playing for the last two hours. Mm -hmm. And you could tell they crafted some of the game and it's just, it was such a back and forth internally. And now they've just kicked them to the side. They're like, go work with Xbox. We got nothing for you. Good. I hope they do because Xbox will treat them well and let them You'd hope make so. what they want to make. You'd hope but, so. Well, because like, Matt, like it's literally how you described it. I didn't play the game, so I don't know. But you were you were saying, like, yeah, you play it and you see it's like a sort of single player experience. You can see where they're going with it, and then it changes. And to me, and I'm not on the inside, I don't know. But to me, that's like, oh, uh, you guys have to make sure you litter you litter our game with um with this uh, games as a service content because if you don't, then then you're not going to fit our vision. Yeah. So to me, that's like, no. No, yeah. this is to me. This isn't on Crystal Dynamics. I don't, even if they're not, if they're not able to handle games as a service, then they shouldn't be making it. You are responsible as the studio at the top. You have the responsibility. You own them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So that's sort of how I see it. And I, I, I think Square, this like pushing blame from Square Enix is really, really gross. I don't like it at all. Just want to shout out Lord Cognito, host of Defining Duke. He says, salute Duke, Maddie, and Lord Kopi. Wanted to send some love to Ham Radio. Thank you, Cog. Much love to you, man. Appreciate the super chat. Happy to see you here in the realm of Ham Radio. Um, when it comes to Square Enix, right, I just find it interesting how this is all developed because, again, I want to go back to Perfect Dark and how I, I think with this news something's lining up where xbox is going to yank them out from square enix i i, I really so. think so like if this will be a, a, a again a multi-year thing kind of like what we're seeing with sega where i genuinely think once perfect dark comes out we will probably see crystal dynamics with xbox i just i can't see after these comments after the the way their last game went the relationship xbox has with crystal dynamics and then daryl gallagher who now works as the initiative, who was the head of Crystal Dynamics during their best years. I just feel there's too much dots mm -hmm. connecting, stars aligning, and Square Enix's complete public disinterest of their own company in their Western branch, which they typically treat like shit anyway, that yeah. they're going to let them go. And I think that's actually a mistake. Um, Crystal Dynamics makes good games. And mm -hmm. that's something that, that shouldn't be forgotten because they made one bad one. Like, yeah, I think Avengers was catastrophic. I thought it was awful. But it's the same mindset I have with Fallout 76. When 76 came out, a lot of people forgot that Bethesda had made Skyrim, Fallout 3, Fallout 4 to a lesser extent. But still, I thought it was a good game. Um, Oblivion, Morrowind. When Anthem came out, we forgot that Bioware, at one point, made us KOTOR, Jade Empire, Dragon Age, Mass Effect... And I know some of those days were more far gone in Bioware's case, but um, Matt, I just feel like the case here where people look at one game and just companies got to go what's like the this kind of biggest cutthroat. problem or what's the biggest problem with all three of the games you mentioned games as a service 76 games as a service. Yeah, they're trying to force these companies or these studios to to make something they're not used to because right. they see Fortnite doing it well. Right. Or whatever studio out there that is that is absolutely making bank on games as a service. You yeah. can't, it's not easy to do. It's not easy. You have to know your audience. You have, because it's like, you have to know what they're okay with. You know, you, it's not like, oh, you can't push the bounds. If you mm -hmm. push the bounds too far, that's it. They're gone. They're going to move to something else. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, look at like Genshin Impact. That's a games as a service game. And recently some fans have been having problems with the game. So they started, they picked their shit up and they started fixing mm -hmm. it and things are getting better. Like, I don't know. I, I genuinely think like Square Enix is, is fucking horrible for this one. I'm definitely not a fan of it. Yeah, I'm with you on that. We'll see how it all develops, though. I think that, again, by the time we see Perfect Dark coming out, uh, mm -hmm. Xbox will have brought them into the fold. That is my prediction there. Just because, again, it's one thing if we're just reading between the lines with Perfect Dark and this collaboration. It's like, okay, they're just doing something. But again, that public kicking to the curb, all of that combined, it just to me reeks of they're they're done they're not working together mm -hmm. anymore or at least for much longer so mm -hmm. we shall see in due time and now let's move on to tap-ins and patron mm -hmm. questions do we have any tap-ins waiting for us we have two perfect number okay so 
we're going to go ahead and bring in, I'm just going to go with the bottom one. That is lactose to the intolerant. And then we'll bring Fortis Horizons in after. Sure. Let's bring in lactose. Lactose. Hello. Are you there? Oh, yeah, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Hi. How's it going? Loud and clear. Oh, pretty good. Oh, I'm glad I made it in. I've been. <laughs> I know. We've been trying to pull you in for a while now. <laughs> right. Apologies. That had to finally redeem myself after my yeah. first attempt. You guys remember that, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, the yeah. kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's my daughter. Actually, we were just sitting on the couch. Uh, she was playing a game here. Oh, so. What game was she playing? Nexomon. Oh, what is that? Yeah. It's uh, it's on, it's on the Xbox. She's playing on the Series X right now, but Nexomon. it's... Nexomon. Um, never heard of it. And, uh, so... I, th I saw this on there. It was on sale for like 10 bucks or something. And I was like, well, she'll probably be into that. There we go. Yeah, so it's, like little, it's like a little Pokemon clone. It looks cute. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's fun. She's actually just starting it up now for the first time. So awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And it started early. <laughs> yeah. All right. Exactly. Oh, no. She, she does. I, I'm, I'm, that's one thing that I, uh, I'm very happy about of, of the, it's just she, my fiance, and I, and, between the two of them, she's definitely the more gaming inclined. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, you had, to, you, had, you, had to, you had to deal with it for a little bit, and then just you know shape the offspring a little bit. It's like we're gonna get a gamer in this family somehow. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm just waiting until she's got the the skills to join me in in some more complex games. I've even tried. Uh, Throw her into Persona. I see you got the Persona <laughs> icon. There. You know, she is actually a fan of Persona. Yeah, she she watched me play through Persona Five Royal. Kid of the and, year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, what's on your mind? What do you want to uh, talk about here with us? Yeah. Um. Well, you know what? I knew I would forget, so I did write it down. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's awesome. Perfect. Okay. Um. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. I've recently gotten really into um, Audible. I've been I've been listening to that at work lately. Okay, and uh, I've gotten into some of these Star Wars Legends books. I'm wondering if either of you guys uh, have much. I think, I think Matt does. Yeah, yeah, I've read. I don't know if it was. I don't think this is a Legends book. Uh, I read I the Princess you... Leia book. That one I really liked. And okay. I read uh, Revan. Of course, I read Revan. Right. I thought you mentioned that you started one of the. Um, this isn't a Legends book, but some of the High Republic stuff. Yes, I I never finished it. I meant to finish it, but I kind of started to lose interest over time. Uh, the the first one. Oh my god, it's gonna bug me. Light of the Jedi. Yes, that one. Light of the Jedi. Yeah, I got yeah. about halfway through. It was good. It was definitely good. I was very interested in the High Republic, but I just started to fall off of it. And I think that was because of inconsistency rather than the content. You did. <laughs> <laughs> all right way to go hey little love why don't you keep playing while, I, while i'm on the phone here, okay <laughs> i love it <laughs> all right yeah so I, um you've been reading I, these books or listening to them rather yeah listening to them listening to them uh i've really gotten into recently the it okay so it's a little confusing they have legends Thrawn novels and then canon Thrawn novels. Are, are you guys familiar with Grand Admiral Thrawn? Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, the blue a dude, yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah, the Chiss from Rebels. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's what most people know him from. Yeah, he is. He is freaking awesome, man. So I've been. I'm just finishing the first Legends book. There's three mm -hmm. of the Legends books uh around him the first one is heir to the empire and that's the one that i'm finishing right now okay and it is super cool i'm like really into it nice um the book i listened to prior to this one was uh star wars plagueis mm. and um they, well it follows yeah palpatine's master that he had was darth right. plagueis and the wise right yeah exactly and it was pretty, it was, I, I really liked it, but naturally it was pretty political because it was mm, setting up sure. episode one pretty right. much. Um, and I thought that was, that was really cool. But some of the politics, especially in the midsection of that were too much for mm -hmm. me at some yeah. times. And I was a little worried that's what this one was going to be. But uh, a friend of mine, yeah, he he recommended it to me and he actually had 
the audio files for him in a Google Drive. So he sent he just sent that to me, and that's where I've been listening to it at. Um, and they're really really cool. This Grand Admiral Thrawn, he is like the greatest tactician in all the Star Wars universe. Huh. Right. Yeah, I um I had enjoyed reading the the, the Star Wars books because there's there's so many and and what they managed to do is just give us give us a good look at characters that maybe don't get a lot of screen time or game time and um so it's it's good to hear that you you've been enjoying them. Do you have any on the horizon that you have been peeping out beyond Grand Admiral Thrawn? Uh, actually, well, that's going to be quite an investment as it is, but um <laughs> I I do have Light of the Jedi. So I'm a little bit bummed out to hear that you fell off on that one. Uh, yeah, I knew that wasn't the best investment, but we'll see. I don't let Matt falling yeah. off dissuade you because I, we had a discussion about this earlier off off the podcast, and Matt is cannot invest himself into anything that isn't a video game. Uh, I'm this either guy has, stupid or I have ADHD. I don't know yet. <laughs> this guy has the entire Demon Slayer uh, manga collection, and he hasn't opened a single book. So yeah. Definitely Let's slap the hell everyone about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, don't let him dissuade you. I think if you're enjoying what you're reading, I'm sure you you would enjoy that as well. I don't have yeah. a lot of experience. I haven't read any of the Star Wars books, but I've been itching to like do some reading. I probably won't be Star Wars because I'm not. I I love Star Wars, but I don't think I'm heavily invested where I want to collect lore from all around the universe. Um, mm. I, this is off topic, but I want to start reading Lord of the Rings and um, sort of lore mm. of that world. Um, so that's something that I'm going to be looking into as in terms of reading, but do go on about Star Wars. Yeah. Um, actually, I was just going to say, I know you said that you're not too interested in, in diving into Star Wars stuff, but mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I recommend to anybody with even a little interest in Star Wars uh, is the Bane trilogy. Have you guys heard of this? Mm -mm. Yes. My friend Vinny Darth loves ben it. He loves it. Oh, it is seriously it is so it is so good it is so awesome so just to give anyone listening and you guys here right uh an idea of what it is is darth bane was an ancient sith who started what's called the rule of two and he's Ooh. the one responsible for uh like the way that most people know the sith mm -hmm. from the star wars uh, like media is there's there's two what the master and what does he say it's one to embody the power oh. and the other to crave it or something like that um and it is fantastic the writing is amazing the characters are excellent like it starts nice. off following bane before he was a sith and uh it's oh my god it's so good I, I, i've heard a lot of good things about it like i said my friend would send me like quotes out of the book like the the descriptions are visceral to say the least so yeah that's that's one yeah, that would be definitely some... like on the top of my list in star wars books of ones i want to get yeah. to if and... i end up picking up a star wars book it'll probably be that one yeah uh fantastic and it's really accessible too i didn't know this until after i bought the the audio books but um I, I think I saw them on YouTube. Like someone just recorded the the audio for it and put it up on YouTube. At least for the first book. Right. Um That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. But Well, thank you for sharing. We we very much appreciate that. And of course, the recommendations are gonna be much appreciated amongst the audience because mm -hmm. I know when I was talking about Light of the Jedi, there were a lot of people who were writing in about it. So I'm sure this will go over very well with them, and we appreciate you uh, spending the time to talk with us on it, and we hopefully we'll hear from you soon. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks for coming yeah. on. No, I'm glad that I was able to make it on, and you guys didn't have to listen to <laughs> Oh, just for some background, just for some background on what happened that first time. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were at a pumpkin patch. and oh, You were doing a my... live call in at a pumpkin patch? Yeah, my dog, I... it was me. My my <laughs> daughter and and my niece and Aww. my niece was off. She was doing some zip line or something, and my right. daughter was playing in a corn pit. And I was like, "Oh, I could, if I get in here quick enough, I might be able to get in, <laughs> you know, <laughs> do it." And, and then, 
I got, you know, I bumped into someone that I knew and then I just uh, put my phone in my pocket right. and I forgot about it. <laughs> and oh, I was listening to that episode. I was like, oh my God. That's so funny. No, don't, don't worry about it. It, it's, uh, oh, right. it, comes with, it comes with the territory on him. We have, right. We have, we have, we have right. people who, who forget they're there and stuff. Uh, yeah. But I'm happy you finally made it. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, just want to say also, um, I really like the new format Thank you. here, guys. Uh, Matt, I've been following you know your channel for several years now, and and I've haven't I don't write in as much as some of the other people in the Discord, but fine, you know no, we're not, I, I we're not owed any of that. Yeah, all right. So I've been following for a long time, and uh, cool to see the live format here. I really like that. Thank so. you. It's, it's been refreshing for me personally, cause you know, I felt with ham radio podcast, you know, I was sharing a show with Carrick who I was doing Defying Duke with and, uh, Dustin. And we all, all three of us felt like we were really like double, triple dipping at times into our same thought mm -hmm. bag. And this show yeah. has been really refreshing for me and it's been really fun to do. So I'm just happy to hear, you know, positive feedback on that. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. No, all the cool. positive feel feedback like I'm just super welcome. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was saying it, it's really cool to just feel like I'm getting to sit down and talk to you guys here for yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people who are not fans of Collins, which we understand, we respect, I think um, until they sit down and chat with us, maybe you don't fully get it. Like there's something fun about mm -hmm. when you're involved in that interaction. Um, and especially because what's happened is I think our show has been more factual <laughs> with this because we have the <laughs> chat that will correct yeah, us. I totally agree. We get a lot of perspectives in. And to me, that's kind of the flavor of the show. Um, so thank you for your support. I, I really do appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, no problem, man. Well, guys, have a good night. I'm going to finish up with dinner here. and Have fun. Uh, yeah, thanks. Wait, wait, one question. One question. Oh. What's, uh, what's on the menu for dinner? <laughs> Ooh, yes. Um, it is fresh store-bought. Dofer's lasagna, the the oh. only the finer. Oh. No, it's, mm. it's my it's my day off, and I just slept in till I slept for like fourteen hours today. And there we go, dude. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I'm just here. I'm just gonna do something AFK, just stick it in the <laughs> oven, and come back in an hour and forty five minutes and right. have some lasagna. Sometimes so, that's what the it. doctor orders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, all right, guys, you guys have a good night. All right, enjoy your gourmet. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thank you, DJ. See, See you around. All right. Oh. And now it's time for Forged Horizons. All right. And then we'll move oh. into our patron questions. Forged Horizons, are you there? Love me some Forged. Oh, he might have actually stepped out. Is this oh, it? No. Oh, no. Well, no we'll give him a second. He's here with yeah, us. Yeah. yeah, we hear him. Yeah. We, he's here. No. You're too quick, Matt. Yeah, I had to pause the stream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. he's dialed that. in. So I am here with a, because I hopped out earlier, but then I heard you, well, y'all should take a sip first, you know, get okay. hydrated. Okay, we'll do that. I can rock with that. Because I'm about to hit you with the most lukewarm taste or take you've ever heard. Okay. Uh, I don't like this soda. This is lukewarm, so this isn't hot like last week. You were top rated comment. A lot of people were not a fan of your take for Fallout, so let's... Let's dive a little bit deeper into the mind of Forge Horizons. What, what do you got for us in this lukewarm area? Okay, in this lukewarm area, it is probably even a hotter take than my previous take. Okay. I cannot stand cold drinks of wow. any sort. Wow. Wait, okay. Do you have a Not fridge? Not water. <laughs> I have a fridge. Okay. I have an ice maker. I just... I can't do cold drinks. I will pick up a soda, and if it's cold, I will let it sit out on the counter until it is warm. Wow. So you're like my grandma. This is when worse I'm... than the fallout take. No yeah. offense. Yeah. No. I, 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 he knows what he's getting into. I, I yeah. know what I'm getting into. Yeah. Here. So you're like my grandma. When I went over to my Nana's house, she would have cans of Coke, like these mini cans that would just oh, sit on the shelf. And they'd, no. They'd be, again, on the shelf, not in the fridge. So it's actually hilarious to say this because I know what it's like to be a, a consumer of the lukewarm drink, if you will. Um, yeah, she has good taste. I don't know about that. So yeah, so I, is I, it I like certain drinks? Like that's what I got to know what? real quick. Is it certain drinks? Or is it all drinks blanket? Yeah, like what about like I milk? can I can do alcohol cold. Okay. I milk has to be cold because warm yeah. milk is just disgusting. I agree. Um, okay. 
but literally anything else, so, I will so within push reason. Warm. When you're like, if you're if you do like a workout or an intensive activity, you want warm water after. Like that's <laughs> oh, your yeah. play. Oh, oh yeah! Wow! <laughs> wow! One hundred percent. Oh my god! That's I live in Wisconsin, so I can just step outside. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, you would have been you would have you would have had a field day if you lived in the time before refrigeration was a thing because you could have had all the warm drinks you wanted oh yeah those are my people those are my people (laughs) that is oh god the soda one is the worst to me no no offense but when i drink like a warm coke like if i just crack it open it tastes so it hurts like i don't like it 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 goes down a little hard yeah yeah it's like it's like it needs to be cold because the carbonation feels a lot heavier Mm -hmm. i don't know i'm not much of a of a soda person anyways but if i do drink soda it, it's all cold it's okay. gotta be okay. okay i'm trying to think here uh of other drinks seltzer Is seltzer going down warm yeah oh, seltzer is gross already now you're doing a warm one ginger beer juice or juice ginger ale. like apple juice yeah, like juice. juice yeah wow because before you open a thing of like apple juice or orange juice. He got like the. Uh, I I can, can leave it that. out in the warm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I can. I leave those out in the garage. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, not even in like your kitchen. You have to put it in an actually warm place. This goes further than that. Hold on. This goes further than that. Condiments. What if you put ketchup on or mayonnaise or I have or uh, mustard? Are those in the fridge cold? Uh, after they're open, they are. Barbecue okay. sauce is always warm, though. Okay, but what about... So you say you don't like cold drinks. Mm. What if it's something that's hot? Like, if you're drinking hot cocoa, do you wait for... I guess most people do, but like, do you wait for it to get like lukewarm? Not like kind of warm. I had some hot cocoa earlier, and I waited a little bit to where it was still hot, but it's not burning my lips. I'm not I'm not injuring myself when right. I drink it. Yeah, no, that that's where it has to be. So you... you but you prefer it to be like at that... It's kind of still hot, but also not like super hot or you like no i want to get lukewarm no with warm stuff i will drink it like a normal person okay okay so it's just with with the cold stuff yeah i I just can't stand it can what about it do you do you not like to me this is this is fascinating i want to like a case study like is it is it um the flavor or do you not like cold things in your mouth i know some people have sensitive teeth so i do have sensitive teeth okay but that's not all of it it just it just hit different. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hold on. Ice cream? Are you an ice cream fan? I'm sorry. I'm just digging. Oh, I love now. ice cream. Yeah. What the fuck? Why do you like ice cream? You're, you don't like you co- cold? It? This is are a lukewarm cold? take. Like, oh, you, no. I know. Do you like let your ice cream melt? Um, No, but I do prefer soft serve over pretty much I, anything uh, else. Me too. Me too. I love so. soft serve ice cream. Okay. Okay. I need to process this a little bit. Um. I'm trying to think of more drinks. I'm really curious. Like, you well, said alcohol. So, like, if you drink a beer, you want a beer? No, no. He said he wanted that cold. Okay. Yeah. Like, know. alcohol is all cold unless it's like a wine or something. Like, my favorite alcoholic beverage is a daiquiri, which is basically just a, an alcoholic slushy. So, sure. Okay. Are I'll you... drink that cold. Okay. Okay. I, th- I think what I got, about, I, I think I understand. Like there's, there's no, that's the thing. We, we, we we have a pretty clear picture here that no 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 I want to know about smoothies. Oh, I didn't like, hear you. Sorry. Go on. If you get a smoothie, like, are are you waiting for it to get warm? Because I feel like those are best cold, like a slurpee. Um, for slurpees, I will take the slurpee cup over to the soda machine to get more soda, and then wow. not put ice in it. So it's not even a slurpee anymore. You're just drinking syrup. I mean, <laughs> I, I just I'm I don't disturbed. like slushies. <laughs> That, okay, but, I mean that's that's fair, that's fair. But at that point, just drink soda. I don't that's know, a I great question. It. How this do you drink? Me angry. How do you drink your I'm iced coffee? Someone said that was funny. I don't like coffee, so I get okay. off easy there. We, we can we can agree there. We can agree there. Yeah, I don't know. I had some coffee. This is kind of deviating, but my sister got like this Starbucks winter coffee, and it was peppermint. And I tasted mm-hmm. it. I'm like, ooh, this tastes good. But then you get the coffee flavor, and it's like, ah. coffee. Like you can tell us all the stuff over coffee that you want but the base coffee bean taste yeah. i'm not there for it 
I wish I liked it. I would love to have that like sophisticated coffee like in the morning rather than. I think it always starts that way. You think you're sophisticated, and then you become addicted to it, and then you devolve yeah. into daily McDonald's coffees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, forged. It's it's been a pleasure chatting with you again. Although we strongly disagree on this one, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, y'all just got bad taste. Yeah, yeah, I'm not bringing you in anymore. Just so you know. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I appreciate you you standing up and and saying what's on your mind though. There's there's courage there yeah. that that is yeah, I had, to, I had to pop back in for it, you know. Of course, man. I honestly more hope welcome. you bring in more hot takes like this. I guess lukewarm. Oh, takes. don't worry, I got more. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we're I got going like to the next five one. five ish weeks of them built up by now. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's perfect. We're well, gonna get to know I'm each other very well. So that's fine. Expect, All to be, right. expect to be dragged in next week for sure because. I'm excited. All right, I'll hit you up with another hot take. All right, we I got a good one that. for you next week. Okay, Ooh, awesome. This one was, we'll this one was an off the cuff one. So. <laughs> All right, Forge, it's been a pleasure talking to you again. Thank you for calling in, and we'll, we'll talk yeah, to you next week. Y'all have a good day. All right, peace out. See you, Forge. See you. Okay, it's time. It is time for patron questions. Yeah, Paul, I we know you were you were lying to him, right? That you're gonna bring him back in. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> In fact, I think we we're probably going to remove him from the Discord. I'm going to talk to some of the map moderators. Yeah, we'll we'll hit up Grimblade. We're going to hit up Paco Luigi. We're going to we're going to hit up everyone and make sure that there's a a, I, a couple censored words like warm and drink together. Yeah, I I know Grim isn't afraid to bring down the band hammer. I trust yeah. Paco. I don't. Maybe. Absolutely. We'll see. <laughs> all right. Well, we got a number of questions that we can sift through here. So let's bang them all out. First one's from Grimblade. Sorry, what were you going to say? We've been just talking over like, each other all episode, I think. I know. <laughs> we really it's, have been. It's, it's like a weird lag or something. Yeah. No, I was just saying, interestingly enough, we still have people writing stuff in. So I was, that's what I'm doing right now. I was jotting those into the, okay. the doc. But go ahead. All right. We'll do we'll do Grim Blades first. Looking at the top reviewed games of the year on Open Critic, Forza Horizon 5 sits at a 92. And the next highest game is at an 89. Despite this, I think we can all agree that Horizon 5 will not win or even be nominated for game of the year at most outlets. Is this fair? This seems like the one year where a sports racing game could ever have a chance. So he also wrote that I answered the question in Discord, um, which I did, but do you want to go first or are you just going to let me? Yeah, uh, go for it. It seems like you had thoughts ready. So yeah, no, I, I think like it sucks because sports and racing games have the potential to be good. But at the end of the day, game of the year is more or less a popularity contest. Um, yes. And I, and I feel like it, I don't want to be this way, but I almost feel as if it, it, it deserves to be, or it needs to be because game of the year means it's, means it's for like, when you, when you look at an outlet or whatever, whoever's doing it, I think it has to represent, I guess it depends, right? But for the game awards, let's just isolate the game awards here. I feel like with the game awards, it has to represent the masses, or at least a little bit. Um, and I think if you bring Forza Horizon 5 into that, I feel like it doesn't represent everyone. Mm. Um, and I know not everyone always, like God of War was Game of the Year, and I didn't play it at the time. But I think what happens is you have like a conses consensus in like the gaming sphere about a video game. And I think those games deserve like the chance at game of the year. And although I have seen a, a good consensus consensus, eh, that is a word Cons <laughs> consensus. Yeah. Three syllables. On, on horizon five. And I have seen like a lot of people talking about it. So I think honestly, I could see horizon five being a nomination. I don't think it'll win, but mm -hmm. it's at the end of the day, it's because like, I think, I think one thing I've realized about video games is certain games just will never be deep enough to, reach that level because at they are stuck with what they are now horizon five is a different example but sports games yeah they're they're always going to be sports games they're they can't really deviate too much and then if they do then it's almost like not a sports game like rocket league mm -hmm. what it what is rocket league right it's a huge deviation from you could say it's like a soccer game but it's also like a, a car game slash racing not really but so like with sports and racing games i feel like it's hard to give them that label of game of the year because there's only so much you can do with that. With that being said, I feel like Horizon 5 is a good example of something that really does deviate and change. So I think it... I know I, in the Discord, I actually said it won't be or shouldn't be, but I think I'm changing my tune here. But, and I think it, it could totally be nominated. 
Uh, based off what I know on the Game Awards voting process of ballots and how they're submitted like a, through outlets. There's also like a seat of people that vote on it, too. Yeah, there's a seat of people. Some of the public voting matters, too, to a mm -hmm. small extent, Jeff Keighley said. So what happens is I've seen when this these set of reviews dropped, a lot of people were like calling a game of the year. So we'll see how mm -hmm. many people within the office agree with that. I think what's going to happen is you have like one person in, in each office who really thinks that. And it'll get its votes, but I don't think it'll get enough votes from the collective of each of the main outlets that gets to vote um, to be listed there. And again, it doesn't matter if the review scores are really high, um, because I think that's what gets it listed on the ballot. But I just think collectively speaking, these reviewers enter a whole different mindset when filling out the game of the year ballot. I, I just mm -hmm. I think something changes there. And I, I feel like to to me, like that's okay. I don't think well, first off, numbered scores already are a little weird as we talked about, but I don't think numbered score like this game scored the highest should be the only mm. nom uh factor into this because I think games have cultural value. And I think games have like social value and not all that sometimes that can't be placed into um a number score. You know what I mean? Right. Like like uh I, I, Among Us didn't win Game of the Year, right? But that game had like such a high impact for the time it came out, um, for what was going on in the world, how to connect. Or Animal Crossing is another one. Yeah. Um, and I think Game of the Year, because it represents the year it came out and not the longevity of the game, I think is also an important factor that a lot of people don't consider. For sure. Good question, Grim. Let's move on to BR Blurry. Yeah. Hello, hand boys. I find myself scrolling through Spotify, always looking for new music fairly often. A huge factor in deciding whether or not I give a band or artist a shot comes down to the cover art on the album. It's becoming a redundant conversation when it comes to movie posters and how all of them are pretty much the same these days. So I wanted to put a question to you regarding games. What game box art do you hold in high regard or would even say is your favorite slash most memorable? Giving a scroll. Sorry, there was more. He, he, he like used the giving a scroll again. I was like, oh, I thought there was just a copy and paste error. He says, given a scroll through my collection and on Game Pass, I find it tricky to spot any game that truly stands out from the crowd. Are games following the same track as movie posters and just becoming formulaic? Now, go for it. So I prepared a little demonstration for you guys because I, I know Matt feels the same way, but I think game box art is something that doesn't get discussed enough. I saw, a, I think Scott the Waz did a video on it and I was so happy because like, Game box art for like physical collectors is such a big thing. I almost feel as if a game has bad box art, it dissuades me from wanting to get a physical. <laughs> and I, I know that sounds weird. It plays but it's a, just a small like, factor though, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely important because that's part of what you're getting. Um, and it's also like this doesn't matter as much, but when you're back in the day when you were at the game store as a, like a little kid or a teenager, a big introduction into that game is like, what does the box look like? What is this telling me about the game? Um, so I prepared a demonstration for you guys. Oh, okay. a little demonstration and, um, here. So we're going to start off with bad because I want to get into bad before we get into good. So this one is contentious because Pokemon has always been a series that has had box art like this. And I think it accurately represents the games, but I just don't like it, especially with Pokemon Sword. Mm. I mean, look at this, guys. You got Zacian, I think his name is, just sitting there. And he, and like, it's so bland and uninspired. It's got a white it's, background. I didn't even, it's got I didn't even realize that. a white background, and they just threw blue like accents here. Um, the back, I like. The back's colorful, and it shows like what the game's about. But the front, mm -hmm. it's just the, it's just the Pokemon, and this is how it's always been. So I can respect it. But for this one specifically, I just found it to be so boring. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? No, I get like, it. Like Ultra, Ultra Sun and Moon had just your legendary there too. But I, I don't know. It just looked a lot better. I didn't grab a copy. I should have. Um, and then the other bad experience. Or experience, <laughs> experience. I had a that, horrible experience buying this game. <laughs> well, I had a horrible experience with this game. I yeah, can get into that too. That's but for sure. The other game is Cyberpunk. And this is another problem I have with game covers. Is You have like, see, they just throw a CG render onto there with like a boring background. Now, I'm going to give Cyberpunk a little credit because I actually kind of like the background here. And I know you don't, Matt, because you find the yellow to be gross. Yes. But... I the reason why I do like it is because you can see the trees back there and the skyscrapers. So it's not a pure yellow background. But beyond that, it's just guy doing cool pose. C <laughs> guy with gun. Guy with gun doing cool pose. And then once again, you get to the back, which I think games always do good with the back. But 
and you start to actually see the game. Um, so those are my bad examples. But now we're going to get into the good examples. And I think this is a little biased because all, all of my good examples are Japanese games. <laughs> but we're going to look at Breath I, of the Wild I here. I think it makes sense, though, because Japanese has like a more art-driven... I think, yeah. I think like that can drive sales for them more than it would here in the yeah, West. I agree. And Breath of the Wild... Now, here's the thing. You have art in the background. It's absolutely beautiful. And you have Link standing here. You know, he's got a sword out and he's looking off. But this is something that you can do in game. This is something that people will look at and like, yeah, I remember standing on a cliff and looking at the vast expanse mm -hmm. in Breath of the Wild. This is something like Cyberpunk. Like, I don't remember ever doing this. <laughs> like, like Unless you're in photo like mode, a, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, this, this doesn't tell me what Cyberpunk is about. It doesn't speak to it on a level. This one does. Um, if Link is, is ready to go on his adventure, uh, the castle back there, and I don't know, the art is just gorgeous. I think I just have a thing for art, because if we take a look at, I had Atelier Ryza pulled out, and I think this is a good example. It's a little cluttered, but you have Ryza, you have mm -hmm. your party members, and this game, um, what's different about it from the first one is you go exploring ruins, and right now they're exploring a ruin. She kind of looks a little surprised. And I don't know, I just, I love when they take art, and they, um... And this is something that you could, like, I feel like when you look at it, you're like, yeah, I could see that sort of being something that's going on in the game. Mm -hmm. um, and my final example is, is, is of course, Nier, but not the original, or Nier Tomita, not the original box, because I found that boring. The Western release had, um, it was a CG render of all of them just sort of sitting there. But this is the Game of the Year edition, which is also what the Japanese art, or the Japanese box had. And it's just more art from, I don't know who the Nier art is. I wish uh, I did. I should. Uh, that that is it name. Yamor? No, that name eludes me right now. But I I know it's a name. <laughs> I, okay. I I, and I know I, it's a specific person who like is reputable amongst that like group of four yeah. that Yoko Taro rolls with. And um, what I like about it is it's distinctive. When I look at it, it's not a CG render. I feel like I'm not looking for everyday game, mm -hmm. like your average game. Um, and I think it's it's sort of telling. Like if you know the story of the game, when you look at the box art, you're gonna be like, yeah. This uh, this is making sense. Like you can really get some context from this cover art, and it's just really pretty. And once again, the back looks great. So right. basically, I I went on a little spiel there, but I think it was enjoyable for you guys. Basically, what what I think about video game box art is, I wanted to one represent your game in a, a a way that where I look at it, I can feel like that is something that could have been done in the game or represents a story or whatever. I don't want it to be lazy, and I want you to do something different than CG. Right I want to see some mm -hmm. art actually that's it i just want to see art because art just looks so good you know yeah. what i mean like it's Absolutely. so nice to represent that game in a different medium 100%. Matt, take it away you know it's hard for me to like summon in my head right away a bad video game box art beyond cyberpunk because i think like doom did it as well and i don't know if doom technically has bad box art but i don't like the new way that games are marketed on the shelves which is like the lone character in the heart of it all um because when you look at them they individually some of them can look cool but when you line them up side by side that's when you start to feel like hey this is starting to really look the same and like no one's injecting creativity and it's a game of copycat so when i think of some of my favorites the chat had already mentioned it a couple of times but i swear i'm not piggybacking when i say dragon age origins uh to me is uh, a really good example of strong box art. I think uh, Dragon Age 2 is probably even a better example. Like you see Hawk front and center. Uh, he's in there in the middle. And then you can... I feel like a combination of the box art, it's because you only see one side when you pick it up. But when you pull the sheet out, it's like a full paper. So it's almost like the front and the back have to feed off each other. And so that's how I look at it. I think of Mass Effect. Like I think Bioware just overall has really, really good box art. I don't think Kotor's box art is that great though, because you have Revenant, or I'm sorry, Malik and um, Bastila there. It's like, yeah, this works. And then you've got this Selkath, like front and center, that was a cut party member that they never fucking removed. Like even in the reprints, they never removed this character that is not a party member that's not in the game. And it always baffled me. I don't know why they didn't do that. Uh, Mega Man box art always, always worked for me because it was one of the few times you could have like a squad front and center and kind of understand what the game was like are you going to have them like running sideways no but you'd see the characters you're playing as and the things they do and that sort of sold it to me like i think x command missions one of those stronger examples uh i also think of 
dishonored. I think dishonored with Corvo Atano with like you could see like the the mark of the outsider. You can see the sword, and you're like, this guy's got something going on. I gotta know what it is. And you flip it over and you find out it's a supernatural assassin game. It's really hard for a piece of art to capture everything a game entails because there's so many layers to it. Um, but as long as you can pique my interest, and I think the best way you do that is by showing a compelling character concept in the universe itself. So like you see Dunwall in the background of Dishonored, and I mm-hmm. like that. It's like I that setting to me is someone who loves like cloudy, rainy, dark. That works very well for me. So that was particularly grabbing. Uh, is it conventionally grabbing? Probably not. And I think that's the issue with both you and I is these aren't conventionally grabbing. Mm-hmm. Like Call of Duty's always the soldier sprinting in the battle from the well, side. I have I have an example of Call of Duty that I grabbed from my shelf, which I think is actually phenomenal. Cold War. And Matt, I think looking at this from yeah, the front, that's you're not decent. gonna really Well, you're you're gonna be like, Oh, it's just a soldier. But if you play the story mode. Yeah, you get this, Matt. You know what I mean? Like it represents what you experience in the game. Not only that, but it may be one soldier, but it like again kind of shows both sides of of the setting through that one soldier. Yeah, yeah, but it, exactly, and like it, it just really, really, really plays into the narrative. Just this art alone. Mm-hmm. Go play Cold War Story if you haven't, and then yeah, discuss some good. other examples. Um, another JRPG, Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts always has great. Oh my box god, art. yeah, Kingdom Hearts box art kicks ass. So good. Yeah, and you have all the characters that are coming together in this game from three like three different parties of uh, Kingdom Hearts characters. And finally, uh, Mass Effect Remaster. <sighs> yeah, Legendary Mass Effect Edition. Legendary Editions. Oh my god, it's fucking fire. Yeah, box the, art. the best, and, best and box art of the year for sure. And it's art. It's yeah. not CG renders. It is art. So yep. I don't know. That's just. I could go on and on about game box arts. I I, uh, I really love when they do it well. It's memorable, and having those on the shelf is just. <sighs> steelbooks are another one. I have like the steel Catherine books steelbook, are a weakness, yeah, and and the Persona Five Royal steelbook, and oh my god, it's yeah, just like, so good. There's also a loud to some of the uh, a degree of being loud in some box arts. And I think Persona's guilty of that. Like I thought Four's box art was way better than Five's. Like Five, Five Royal. Like oh. as much as I love those games, like I thought they were too loud. Strikers is is horrible. Like Strikers I, box art is horrendous. Yeah. And it is art too. Yeah, it's art, so. but it's like it, it's what happens when it's like this is for our fans. And even mm-hmm. as a fan, I'm like, I can barely see what the fuck is happening here. And so that's that's, that's where that's art can get too loud. And I think it's why they stick with the simple and clean because it's like, you know what? You can, you can only be bland here. Or you could do what EA does, which is a awful garbage tier Photoshop montage. Yeah. I'm I just going to bring out Persona. All right. You bring out Persona in the meantime. Here we go. He's, a, he's wheeling back. Do you have a, uh, a super chat? No, 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 no. I was getting, I was, I was just getting ready to to scroll down. Oh, and, what? And I just want to say, like, Royal is very simple and clean, but like, it's so good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Isn't that like, the is, is that the steel book though, or is the cover art like yeah. that too for Royal? I don't. I think the cover art is very different. I'm pretty yeah. sure it's very. Different. I was it's say. probably the loudness you're talking about, but yeah, I don't know. I think if you want simplicity, you can have it where it's like mm-hmm. a blank background. You just have to accommodate for like like having cool art. Yeah. And, um, We've gone on for too long. You want to move on? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, sorry. I was like in the process of just scrolling down my notes. Um, <laughs> let's talk with natural calamity. Greetings, Kopi, the new fighter in Smash, and Maddie. The, this is not accurate. The champion, the ten-time Smash tournament victor. Now, That's last week with your ice capades, which was very riveting, might I say. How do you feel about ice in your alcohol? One, two, or three? Oh heavens, the audience demands to know. I don't drink enough to have a, a specific amount, and I know you don't either. So I don't drink at all. Um, yeah, I don't know. We could just blow we're, right past this. That's fine. Well, well I, I do want to hold on. I just want to say, like, alcohol is not really about the taste most of the time. So I feel like ice would be fine. You know, if if my alcohol gets diluted, it's I'm more worried about how it makes me feel rather than how it tastes, especially with something like fucking vodka, which tastes horrendous. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah, ice is okay. I put sake on my Christmas list. We'll, we'll see what happens with that. I really yeah, want to try it try out. I'd I try a little sake. I don't yeah. think it'll taste good, but... Yeah, I don't know. I was looking up on Reddit like sake for beginners, and people were recommending <laughs> some... Uh, oh, what was it? I can't remember off the top of my head. But I also, like, when I... Because my mom's always like, yeah, send me a couple things to get you. I was like, okay. So I did, and I try to just forget it, so that's always a surprise. But um, You're going to live that fantasy of living in Japan. Yes, we were exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna take it. I have a cup that I got from 
uh, we went to H Mart, Laley and I did, and they had a cool like sake cup. And I was like, I like this. I'm going to buy this just because I like the cup. And I was like, I should get sake one day. And so I threw mm -hmm. it on the Christmas list. I was like, why not? We'll see what happens. In Bethesda games, do you do the thing where you take all the shopkeeper's money? And I had and an idea I had was the shopkeeper could have more autonomy and look at the player and say, no, I won't trade for that. I need some money too to feed my family. Uh, so the way you solve this is just, uh, I think Skyrim does this, um, is there is a set amount of money uh, that, that the vendor will have and it's based off their inventory. I know Divinity Original Sin 2 does this where if I were to take their money and try to sell them something, they couldn't just buy it. They would have a currency um, that was limited there. So uh, I don't personally do that in, in Bethesda games. Do you take the shopkeeper's money? Dude, I rob them. I, I, I give them like trash. I'll throw like <laughs> junk at them and take their money. Um, but I, I would love to see Bethesda games or like games with shopkeepers in general sort of like sh sift through. If I'm going to an apparel vendor and I'm selling them junk, they should like not buy it from me. Right. They should only buy apparel from me. <clears throat> I feel like that's a small thing that could really immerse you into your world. Um, and also, like, I do think it'd be cool if, if you try to sell them a bunch of shit and they just won't let you because they won't have money. Right. Maybe like your a higher barter skill could really convince them to buy from you. Um, because I never really invest in barter in Fallout, so yeah, same. I feel like that that could be something that really I just go with speech because it's like barter but better. <laughs> yeah, and, so, at least in Fallout Four, um, there's that perk which when you shoot enemies they blow up and drop caps, so you just make money yeah. by literally playing the game. Especially that mm -hmm. with bloody mess, you just you, you make an immense amount of caps that way. I remember when Fallout Four came out, a ton of people were watching my gameplay, going like, "What is that perk? That looks really good." And uh, it's like a must-have if you're trying to just stay lucrative in that game. <clears throat> now, what's weird is that Natural Calamity did ask us multiple questions, and he labels this one question as if he didn't ask two <laughs> beforehand. <laughs> he says, how close do you think Mojang and the developer of Minecraft Dungeons is? They add many new enemies, and the ideas to the table with Minecraft Dungeons that I uh, feel make the game feel alive and push the Minecraft brand forward. Do you think that they will add some of these ideas to the Mi Minecraft main game with new enemy types and maybe weapon types or things of this nature? Now, I'm going to double check real quick. I should have done this before a show, but that's okay. We got time. Uh, <laughs> I'm almost 100% sure that a division of Mojang develops Minecraft dungeons. What I'm going to say about this is I'm going to do a little bit of Minecraft slander because I fucking hate <laughs> how they handle Minecraft right now. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, don't I haven't even anybody... paid attention to it. So I don't know if anyone here follows how Minecraft uh, develops content. But basically, for the most part, they have one big annual release every year, which already is like, come on, you guys can do better. It's fucking Minecraft. People mod the shit out of that game. It's not hard to, to develop for. Right. But um, what what I'm getting at here is they will present three mobs to your audience. And then they make you pick one for the update to give to people three and they're usually all really cool and like okay guys you're gonna vote for this and the other two you'll never see in mine that's but weird you, I, know that. I know right and it happens annually at minecon fuck it's called and i like the idea like oh interactivity but what ends up happening is one content creators will just make their audiences pick what they want so it's really what content creators want and two all of these creatures sound cool and they already developed the ideas of how they're going to work in the game. So why aren't we getting them in the game? Mm -hmm. um, so Minecraft suffers from that. And I think like if they brought stuff in from dungeons, that'd be really cool. I would love to see the enemy types and weapons in Minecraft. But I also do enjoy some simplicity. I think Minecraft needs to hold on to some of its simplicity. Yes, I agree. And there was it was Mojang and Double Eleven. Double Eleven's responsible for like Little Big Planet on Vita. Uh, they're responsible for Prison Architect on Switch, um, the Lego Harry Potter games, uh, years one through seven on Switch and Xbox. They did the PC version for Crackdown 3. So it seems like they co-developed this alongside Mo Yang. So just so you know, um, Natural, that these are these are two relatively separate, I'm sorry, uh, combined entities for the most part. Let's move on to Shibe. 
Hey, fellas, hope you're doing well. I'm happy to say that after a long time, I've recently returned back to the podcast, and boy, have I missed out on so much great content over the years. It's been an absolute joy to fill up my workdays and car rides with your engaging, in-depth conversations. I decided to finally give Fallout 76 a go, and I have to say, I'm actually pretty impressed at how cleaned up it is. After listening to you and Carrick gush so much gush so much about Vampire, I decided to give it another go, and I have to say I'm quite enthralled. I suppose my question would be, is there any games you've given a second chance or even a third chance it's finally clicked with you? Keep up the great work, and I'm so happy to be a Patreon of such a great podcast and channel. Thank you so much, eBay. We appreciate you immensely for those kind words. Um, a game that you've given a second or third chance to, and it finally quick with, I said quicked, clicked with you. <laughs> Uh, do you have one that comes to mind right away? I was looking through my, I was grabbing my controller so I could look through my like PlayStation games real quick. But I know one that I, it's kind of a bad example, but I'll say it anyway. And it's Dark Souls One mm. because I first played it when I was really young on Xbox 360 through like Xbox Gold because it was free, and I I thought it was a horrible game. And I was like, this game is is horrible because I walked in a direction and I got killed pretty quickly by the right. skeletons in the, in the graveyard. And I was like. This is so unbalanced. Why am I playing this? And I stopped playing it. And then years later, when I actually played other Souls games and I know how they operate, I'm supposed to play them, um, I enjoyed it a lot more. So that's my example. But I think I ho I want to say I have a better one, but maybe I don't. Oh, I, Bioshock. Uh, oh, yes. That's, another, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a big one where I, I picked it up and I just like dropped it and then I ended up playing it. I'm like, yeah, this is fire. Oh, man. I... um. I have so many that come to mind. There's, <laughs> I, been, there's been so many games uh, and hilariously, some of my favorite games like Mass Effect. I didn't beat the first time I played it. Dragon Age Origins. Oh. I didn't beat the first time I played it. KOTOR. I did. Uh, New Vegas is another one. Fallout 3 is my most definitive example of like, I fucking hated this when I first played it and I loved it. Um, I could, I, I might, I'm probably going to say Divinity Original Sin 1 is my most fresh example of this uh, because when I think about it, I bought it, I played it, and it didn't quite click, and then I started another playthrough a second time a little bit later, um, and it, that's when it really started to move. Like That's the thing is I knew I loved something about it. I made a video about it, how much I really enjoyed it, uh, but then I fell off, and then you come back, and you're like, eh. This really isn't it. And then you come back again, and it, it, that's when it really was firing on all cylinders for me. That's got to be an easy example. Um, but beyond that, there were like a ton of little examples um, that I could that I could I could pull off the top of the dome. Like I know Odd World was one I I wrestled with a little bit, like the two D ones when I was playing New and Tasty. I was like, I don't like this, but then I overcame the difficulty. I have a lot of patience with games though. Like I know a lot of people have like the one hour rule. Like if you don't grab me in the first hour, I'm done. So for me, a lot of times I'm not putting it down, picking it back up. It's like, I stick with a thing because for me, if I'm only playing very good games and games, I love, I start to kind of, you lose yourself in what makes a game bad. What makes a game not click mm -hmm. in specific genres. So I try to stick with things, even if I'm not liking them, but there definitely are examples where I have to, leave and come back and most times when i do leave it's because something else came out that was more interesting or work called my name and not just like uh oh it's not clicking with me because i want to know why fully it's not clicking with me and that's just kind of me being a little ocd if you will yeah tales of arise is an example of a game where i'll probably end up going back to it because something isn't clicking with it uh with me when i played it and i didn't beat it but i was enjoying certain aspects of it like I thought the combat was like kind of fun. I didn't think it was as crazy as like you were making it out to be or a lot of other people. Um, but I I don't know. I, I like the characters too. So I think I, I agree. Like other things call your name and then you get to that drought period where you want to try it again. And I feel like Tales of Arise will be a game that I return to and I enjoy. But um, The Witcher 3 is one that I never beat and I dropped so many times. And I don't know why because I can't tell you what I don't enjoy. Hmm. It's so weird. That is it's the peculiar. weirdest thing. The Witcher 3 is a game that I don't understand for myself. Like I don't understand how I feel about it. <laughs> I don't know why I end up dropping it. I don't know what pulls me away from it. It might just be coincidence every time I play it, something else calls my name. But what I have played of it, I really enjoy. So I, I, I need just, to like... Hmm. I think it's because would, the end of the arcs are where the game gets really hot. Like It's like, oh, this is yeah. really good. Like, this is top tier stuff. But you have to get to that. Otherwise, it's like 
open world like some checklist stuff mm -hmm. there's some good quests here and there but it's mm -hmm. not you don't get to the masterful stuff until like the end of each main arc i think and that's where it's like oh shit but i think that's why some people don't and they kind of they kind of bounce off of the witcher 3 a lot easier yeah um david portnoff said that this applies for more um also for other things outside of games like with bad movies songs shows mm -hmm. or whatever and i agree and that's sort of what matt was saying like you have to play something that's mediocre or or just bad in general um and if you make it fun by laughing at it or like goofing around that it, it can actually be enjoyable but then it really yeah. makes those games shine like it's a yin yang type deal you got to have Absolutely. the good you got to have the bad and the bad makes the good that much more better there you go Monster Potez 93 writes in, Maddie and Kopi, I got the perfect game for you guys. November 11th is the date for KOTOR on Switch, GTA Definitive Edition, and Skyrim re-release. Now, for the game. One of them you play on day one. Second, goes to the backlog for at least a year. Third, it never exists. Love to know your guys' answers, and Maddie, good luck. I know what Matt's picking. Yeah, yeah, so... <laughs> It's KOTOR Day 1, Skyrim backlog for at least a year. GTA, you don't have to exist. You can fuck off. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Not so, even that. It just it, It's just fuck off. I don't need GTA. <laughs> the other two I uh, need. For me, it's kind of hard because I don't think any of these are going to be like day ones. But if I had to pick, it would probably be Skyrim re-release because I want to see that new content. And I feel like... As a guide writer, I might need to write some guides on some of this content. Good point. <laughs> uh, I, I got a I got a, a pointer from Matt saying this is this is going to be good. So yes, absolutely. And then, and then number two would be GTA Definitive Edition because I want to try all those games. Um, I've never played them, and I I really like what they did with the graphics. Mm. I think it's so much cooler than just upscaling. I think like it's it looks very polygonal, but in a cool way. And then the last one is Kotor and Switch. Not because I don't like Kotor, I love Kotor. But because I played it recently enough where I don't need to replay it. That's fair. And I'd rather play KOTOR too. That's much, totally much fair. I, I totally understand, believe it or not. All right. We got Paco Luigi. Now, which one do I read? Because it's been copy and pasted twice. Did I put it? You did put it twice. Put it? Oh, that's oh. fine. We'll just read the first one then. Okay. All right. Paco Luigi writes in, Greetings, gentlemen. Can we finally put this damn ice cube thing to rest? I propose a field day event where we have Team Maddie and Team Kopi to compete. The date can be to be determined until COVID eases up again for the Hamily to convene at a neutral site. However, I strongly suggest one condition. Kobe's team should be stacked with ringers for the sole purpose of putting Matt flat on his back, just like his soda. P.S. When is Golden Sun, the lost age, being featured on Retro Rebound, asking for a friend, best Paco? So funny enough, Paco, you got to listen to our second tap in. This has been settled. And you got to yeah. just hear the results for yourself, man all you got to do I, I feel like Paco might have been here and he uh he yeah knows that I, I won yeah. Matt Matt admitted his defeat immediately I bent the knee but then he but but it, it was an interesting tactic guys like this strategy I've never seen it um <laughs> I, I've never seen anyone do this but he admitted defeat very quickly and then and then he tries to tries to pull back a little bit and was like Wait, well hold on I have some I had a so, couple of points I had to get out there yeah and they were they were okay at best. You you still lost. Look, and we ended up on the even ground when you when you took your second sips. You were like, you know what, Matt? I get the no, ice. This is not even ground or even ground at all. This isn't even ground. All I said was I can appreciate it being cool. <laughs> I still win. I still do. Look, I've never taken your victory away. I just said we're we're on even ground here. That's all. Yeah, it's just, it's not so much that. It's just that the, the loss hurts. I get it, Matt. I yeah, know. my you're, ego can't handle that. You're feeling a little fragile right now. I am. And it'll be fine after the pod. You can go. Yeah, I can go, go off sit the in the bathtub, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Curl up, hold my knees. Uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, Golden Sun Lost Age on Retro Rebound. I have to play that, Paco. I have not played that in full. I have to get the game complete in box because that's kind of my rule for Retro Rebound is I want to like show the thing and open it up, talk about it. So um, we have a two-week plan set in place now for Retro Rebound uh, that should carry us through the Xbox anniversary. Uh, but don't worry, we will we will bounce back to Golden Sun because our best video outside of uh, our PS3 game showcase on Retro Rebound was Golden Sun, which is great because that's, you know, those kind of retrospective videos are going to be a big part of that channel. So really happy to see that. But uh, thank you for your investment in that channel and everyone else's. We appreciate it immensely. But that is our last write-in for the yeah. seventh episode, I almost said eighth, of Ham Radio Live. We appreciate everyone who tuned in with us live here. And of course, for those listening to the end of the show 
whether you're on mobile, YouTube, whatever, we appreciate you immensely. Uh, Paul, any closing thoughts here? Should we wrap this one up? Um, I just want to say that like the, the tap-ins you guys bring in are, are great. I love talking to everybody. Um, and I, I, I just, I love how we get this, these developments of like these, these battles, these wars where we have to demonstrate flat soda and, and ice water, yeah. ice water and ice and stuff. And I think that's what makes ham radio live special. And I would love to see more of that. So it's like what I was talking for horizons, bring in these like crazy hot takes, bring in these like out of bounds questions. Like if it has nothing to do with gaming, I don't care. None of us care. Yeah. Um, and ga gaming questions are great too, but I just, I think like that's really just shooting the shit with Matt and getting to bring him down because he, he's way too high <laughs> on the pedestal. His ego's way too up there. He's too privileged. Yep. Um, <laughs> just, just give me those opportunities a little bit more. Of course. We have to, we have to, we have to bring me down a level. So, of course, you're more mm -hmm. than welcome to try. I, I appreciate anyone who calls in and, and attempts to level me. And uh, yeah, there, there's been one success in our in our seven episode history, and I'm sure that'll be the uh, the last one because it won't be as easy <laughs> next time. Uh, right, okay. We we appreciate though everyone who does support the show, and we will see you all next Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern time to record the show live. And if you're listening afterwards, we just thank you for, for tuning in. And we'll see you on Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Other than that, early access is available on the Patreon. Uh, immediately once the show finishes, I just post the uh, the unlisted version there. And that's all I've got for you. So thank you all so much again for tuning in. It's been great chatting with all of you. And we'll see you next week for Episode 8. Peace out. <laughs>